Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, November 12th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Mark Weibrot, Westbrot, Weisbrot, sorry, co-director with Dean Baker of the Center for Economic Policy Research in Washington, D.C., also the president of Just Foreign Policy, on the question of the coup or not coup in Bolivia. Also on the program today, DACA in front of the Supreme Court. And on the eve of public impeachment hearings, they're happening tomorrow, folks. Closed-door depositions reveal the Pentagon's questions about the Ukraine money holdup. Meanwhile, speaking of the Pentagon, the U.S. military is monitoring interfaith groups opposed to child kidnappings at the border because of course it is a new Gallup poll this one not about the primary this one shows that 34 million Americans lost a friend or family member in the past five years because they could not afford health care treatment Meanwhile, Trump administration says the EPA will now purposely do less scientific and medical research to determine policy. Turkey is now assaulting civilians in northern Syria and threatening the EU if the EU sanctions, excuse me, levies sanctions. 11,000 scientists from 153 nations warn of untold suffering because of climate change. And lastly, in Roger Stone's ongoing perjury trial, Rick Gates says that Roger Stone had advanced knowledge of the WikiLeaks dumps. All this and more on today's program. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, pleasure to have you uh, here today. A lot of stuff going on. We have this uh, Roger Stone trial, and where that goes largely is a a decision of Nancy Pelosi's, oddly enough. There's a lot of stuff that's coming down in that trial that I think could be uh, further grounds for impeachment if the Democrats decide to uh, pursue that. It does not look like that's what they're going to do. But tomorrow they will be presenting uh, the first of public testimony Reports are that they are very sensitive to the idea that folks can't follow this, that people don't like to watch long series anymore. They just want to see the first hour of the show. And so uh, that's the way it's going to be designed. Starting at 10 a.m. tomorrow, we're going to be doing a live stream. We will uh, break and then just go back into the show don't know what we're going to do on the show tomorrow. May just cover uh, some news stories, which is the original plan. May continue on with the testimony, depending on what's going on. But um, as soon as the hearings start, we'll be live, so you can check us out. For today, we will be talking to uh, Mark Weisbrot, uh about uh, what's going on in Bolivia, just in terms of the American intervention. Because, you know, I, frankly, I've gotten a lot of emails from... 
uh, Bolivians, from folks who are married to a Bolivian, um, and who take issue with the 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 idea that this was a coup in Bolivia, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult from uh, you know, uh, and and the uh, excuse me the. Uh, Organization of American States just came out uh, with a report as to voting irregularities. Very difficult to be sitting uh, here in the United States and assess the voting irregularities of what's going on in Bolivia. It's very hard to do that, to sit here in Brooklyn and assess the voting irregularities that are going on in Georgia. In fact, it's also very difficult to be sitting in the state of Georgia and assess the voting irregularities in Georgia. I mean, this goes for everywhere. I don't mean to single out Georgia, although that's the, one of the most obvious cases. Um, it happens here, too. It happens here, too, as well. Uh, people forget there are two counties just around New York City, including parts of New York City, that were formerly under preclearance provisions of the uh, Voting Rights Act because of problems in the past with voting discrepancies. Um, the uh, I want to talk to um, Mark Weisbrot about this uh, to get, uh, at the very least, to get people up to date as to the sort of the TikToks and the issues in Bolivia. I can tell you that, uh, and maybe we should pull some of that footage. Do we have the footage of the uh, uh, masked uh, military uh, guys bringing in election officials? That's usually a sign that maybe this isn't the most democratic of processes. Um but uh, we, we, will, we will get there. In the meantime, uh, uh, Nomi Const is with us today. Hello, Nomi. Hello. And uh, she's going to be with us uh, through the show into the uh, fun half of the program. Uh, Michael is um, taking a, a, an extended vacation to California. I'm not a, uh, 100% sure. I think he's going to be on some TYT shows and who knows what else um, out there. Uh, but uh, Nomi is here with us, as is, of course, Jamie and Matt and Brendan. Um, What's up? And we will, <laughs> we will get into all this. All right, let's start with this. Um, this is not the first time that Joe Biden has said stuff like this. Nomi, uh, I think, as you're aware. And I, well, I will renew the renewal of my call uh, for something specific from reporters after we play this uh, clip. This is um, a uh, presidential town hall. When did this happen? Like two nights ago? Last night. Are they still doing these? I, I, it, it is pretty oh, stunning that um, it, it garners no attention right. from anybody because there's no one who, I, I mean, there's no one who seems to be genuinely interested in Joe Biden. And every time that we hear somebody is contemplating jumping into the race, whether it's Bloomberg or Deval Patrick or... I don't know, Oprah or whomever it is, that, that is specifically a vote of no confidence of Joe Biden. Right. I mean, that's exactly what it is. And because these are people who are afraid that uh, Bernie Sanders will win. Maybe they're afraid that Elizabeth Warren will win. They're afraid that Joe Biden's going to lose. Right. Here is Joe Biden on CNN Town Hall last night. With Trump out of oh, the way. Oh, pause it. I'm sorry. The question is, you were a senator during the impeachment probes of Nixon and Clinton. What's the, oh, no, that's not the question. The question is, why do you think you're going to be able to deal with the Republicans when you have, chuckle, chuckle, defeated Donald Trump? With Trump out of the way, I predict you. Now, my 89 opponents are running for the nomination are going to say something different. But let me just say, I honest to God believe with Trump out of the way, you're going to find people screwing up a lot more courage than they had before to say, OK, OK, I can cooperate. I can move now. I, I, I have more leeway because look what he does. you got Jeff Sessions in Alabama saying, please don't say anything negative about me, Mr. President. Please don't say anything negative. I know you don't like me. Come on. This is just it, the politics has gotten just so out of whack, but it's going to come back and whack. <laughs> this. It's going to. So now <laughs> it is quoting Whitney very, Houston. very hard to assess whether the politics will come back and whack. Um, <laughs> I want that on a shirt. <laughs> but let's just start with this. 2009. Politico 
reports on uh, on June 1st, 2009. What was it? June? Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Uh, June 1st, 2012. President Obama told supporters that he expected the gridlock to end after the election when Republicans could stop worrying about voting him out of office. The fever will break. They said this. Uh, they said this after 2010, too. Now they've got some power. Now they're going to have to deal with it. They've been saying this over and over again. But here's my question. When Joe Biden says that, aside from being deluded, why, why is no one asking him, why do you think you can do this better than Barack Obama? Mm. Because Donald Trump was not there when Mitch McConnell said, we're not going to hold hearings from uh, Merrick Garland. Donald Trump was not there when Mitch McConnell said, we're not going to seat any of your judges. We're not going to allow any nominations. Uh, all the obstruction. We're not going to even support the idea that um, Barack Obama wants to cut Social Security. We're not even going to take yes for an, for an answer. Um, why has no one asked him that? Because it's his good friend, Jeff Sessions. He served in the Senate with him for 30 years or however many years. You know, this is the guy who would, who would reach across the aisle and have a beer with the Republican. He can have a real conversation. I bet you that's his message. But but I, I, then why didn't he do it when Obama was president? He was going to save that? Of course. I mean, you and I both know that. But right. That's their, their messaging. This seems to me to be a, a great question for a reporter to ask, because I think it takes about three questions before he gets to having to say, well, because I'm white. Don't forget, Michael Bloomberg will be the one who can do it. <laughs> That is his message. No, come on. I mean, that is. It's ultimately because he's white. I mean, that's that's the ultimate. That's the, you know, is that Barack the subtext? Obama. The subtext here is if you want to win back white America, go with Joe Biden, who won Barack Obama, white America. Right. White working class America. I mean, that's uh, that's certainly, I think, why uh, Obama picked him. Right. And now, of course, we should be clear that was a... Um, 12 year younger, a 13 year younger Joe Biden, mm -hmm. who wasn't looking to whack in when the government returns or what? What is he? He's going to whack <laughs> back. Of whack. He's going to come back and whack. <laughs> well, look, Bernie had back in black at his rally. That's right. True. So That's maybe Biden, he's got back in whack. Back in whack. <laughs> Which is like white black. I think that's that's what he's saying. Oh, I see. Yeah. What I, oh. Now it all comes uh, clear. Oh, I see. Now that now actually that makes sense for the first time. Um, <laughs> it takes a genius like me to figure out how Joe Biden speaks. Do you think Bloomberg is going to jump into the uh, race? I mean, his he's been the criticism of the last couple of days isn't just it just it didn't stay on Twitter. It really picked up by mainstream media. I mean, when when The New York Times talks about Bloomberg getting criticized, I don't know. I mean, he he's bored, clearly. Uh, if he's there to be a spoiler for for the left, I don't even think that's the case, actually. I think that they're actually concerned. You know, they probably think they have the Democratic primary because the truth is Joe Biden is doing well in the polls still, despite all of this. Right. I mean, it's it's the people watching CNN uh, town halls who are the ones being polled. And we don't know how that's going to you know play out in New Hampshire and Iowa because they're not they're not closed primary states In closed primary states. You know, the Democratic establishment does well. So, OK, Joe Biden becomes a nominee and he gets he gets ruined by Donald Trump. I think that's his his take is he's the only one who can beat Trump in his mind. But is uh, but but are we seeing all these people jump in or at least starting to to wonder about it because they're all afraid that Biden's going to not not only not win in Iowa and New Hampshire. Right. I mean, he's leading in the polls, right. but it's pretty precarious lead it seems like. Um and if he comes in third yeah. Or fourth, because Pete Buttigieg is now in third place. Uh, it is now Biden, Warren, and right. Buttigieg, God. and then Sanders in in these polls. Now these are, you know, th that I don't think that's the average of the polls. These are just the most recent polls, mm -hmm. and 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 who knows? And uh, I say that with the caveat that uh, Sanders' uh, theory of uh, of the campaign is to reach voters who may not show up in the polling. We, we can't test that proposition like anybody until, under 40. <laughs> right. We can't test that proposition until the actual election. But there seems to be a fear that uh, Biden could lose badly enough in New Hampshire and mm -hmm. in uh, Iowa mm -hmm. that he begins to crumble in South Carolina. Right. And then it's, it's Johnny ballgame for him. Or he has no money to do that. Right. I, I 
actually don't think I think they're 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 playing it safe. Like, you know, the business industry likes to have bets on all the ponies, not just, you know, one. So part of it is um they're setting up they just set up a super PAC for Joe Biden, you know, to to run ads for him because it seems like he only had four donors and they right. all maxed out. And so now they're gonna take the rest of their money and put it in a super PAC. I think having Deval Patrick is a little bit of the magic of the um the magical thinking of the Obama coalition or the Obama map of two thousand eight because they're still attached to that idea. Right. And I, There's so many people out there looking for a Bain Capital, uh, for a, um, exactly. you know, uh, a hedge fund guy. A guy who made money off of the right. homeowner's crisis. Right. Um, and of course, you know, Bloomberg, it's, it's the billionaire thing. Like, I'm a better billionaire than you. Like, people love Michael Bloomberg, you know, somebody who believes in democracy so much so that he had to extend his own term here and, you know, stop and frisk. There's a legacy of, of destruction that he's caused um, that's left in this city, income inequality, oligarchs dumping their cash in, in real estate, dr- driving it up for everybody else. This, he's not going to do well in the Democratic primary. But I think the bet is, if Biden cannot take it to South Carolina because he doesn't have the money and the, the, the primaries aren't closed, that there are other paths to victory, including Pete Buttigieg. Although I don't think that, that the establishment thinks Pete right. can beat Trump. Right. And ultimately, they're thinking, how can we make money off the next presidency? Because right now, we're not making enough money off the right. presidency. So, so you, are you saying that Bloomberg's running in the Democratic primary to the extent that he does is really trying to set up a third party, um, a third party run? May, I mean, if, if or just like a pull the pull the you know emergency cord type emergency of situation. cord situation, he could run for third. I mean, if if so far if it doesn't Sanders, make sense to me. If Sanders wins, yep. And I think you know, I think the whole thing about Warren, uh, the billionaires being afraid of Warren. I think billionaires on TV are afraid afraid of Warren. Billionaires who are operating in the Democratic Party primary process of of, of dumping money and in, into candidates. I don't think they're actually afraid of her. You know, the second Soros money goes into, you know, the Warren campaign, that's like a signal that she plays well with us. Right. Um, all right. Well, well, we will get to more on that uh, later. But uh, support for today's show comes from uh, Third Love. Third Love designs bras with breast size and shape in mind for a perfect fit and premium feel. Are you selling this? I did. It's true. <laughs> um, I, we have a, um, no, it's not my personal testimonial we have a, a specific uh, bra tester on the show and uh, this is what she had to say i like that they don't have a zillion options so it's easy to choose something quickly the fit is great i usually have to return most bras i order online even though they're in my size i ordered two both fit that almost never happens super comfortable for an everyday bra but not as boring as most t-shirt bras subtle cute details so i don't feel basic Folks, uh, I've been told this is hands down the most comfortable bra you'll own. Straps that won't slip, tagless labels, not to mention lightweight. It's got super thin memory foam cups to mold your shape. Every customer has 60 days to put their bra to test. And if you don't love it, check this out. This is actually, you're going to be impressed by this. You return it, Third Love will wash it and donate it to a woman in need. Oh. Supporting charities in their local San Francisco Bay Area and across the United States. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone, so they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. I'm sold. There you go. Go to thirdlove.com slash majority now to find your perfect fitting bra. Get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash majority for 15% off today. This is also going to interest you. I don't know if you know this about me, Nomi, but I'm... I'm very, very, uh, I've become very, very specific and picky about dental hygiene. Oh. Yeah. Is that because you're aging? It is because I'm aging. It is. <laughs> it's true, kidding. actually. And my dentist was like, you got to get, you got to get on the ball here. What do you think is the number one, the best thing about a toothbrush? Like, what is the most important thing about a toothbrush? Flexibility. That's a good answer, but you're wrong. Okay. It is using it oh, oh jesus yeah I, it's very basic <laughs> but if you ask your dentist they will tell you it's less about uh the actual toothbrush and more about the habit of using it now with that said electric toothbrushes that vibrate are best mm-hmm. there's no doubt about that but this is what makes quip so special quip's got the sensitive vibrations it's got a built-in timer oh so it basically tells you 
30 seconds here, 30 seconds here, 30 seconds here. It's got pulses in between. Gives you the, the rec- dentist recommended two minutes. Sometimes I'll do four. I'm not going to lie. Overachiever here. It's true. Um, Quip automatically delivers the brush heads to you every three months mm. because people don't change their toothbrush enough. Bingo. Right? It gives you clean new bristles right on schedule. And it is not like one of those big bulky uh, electric toothbrush. It's designed like a regular toothbrush. And it has a travel cap that doubles as a mirror mount as well. So the bottom line is, it's not a situation where you put it on your small sink like you have in New York City and Mm -hmm. it falls over and then it falls on the floor and you don't want to use it anymore. This is very handy. You can travel with it. And the bottom line is, you end up brushing on a regular basis and that's what you need to do. That is what is done for me. I gave one to my sister. Her dentist, her dentist said to her to thank me. Wow. Yeah. That is a true story. Now, do you have female story. testimonial of the vibrating toothbrush too? No, I don't. That okay. is uh, that is all mine. Actually, my entire family. <laughs> did I go there? <laughs> you did. I was waiting to see how. Well, listen, Quip starts at just $25. You'll get your first refill free at getquip.com slash majority. They send it to you every three months. So you don't have to worry about it. Simple way to support the show and to start brushing better. Now's the time to start, Nomi. I'm not making any, I'm not making any, I'm not trying to say anything. Please don't zoom in here. Uh, but you have to go to getquip, Q-U-I-P dot com slash majority to get your first refill free. All right, folks, quick break. When we come back, uh, Mark Weiss brought on what's going on in Bolivia. We'll be right back. <laughs> Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Mark Weisbrot. He is an economist and columnist, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, D.C. His latest is in The Nation uh, magazine, The Trump Administration Undercutting Democracy in Bolivia. The subtitle, Will the U.S. and the Organization of American States Once Again Be Able to Overturn Election Results? Uh, Mark, welcome to the program. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So, all right. Now, Mark, th- there's there's a, a lot of controversy over how to characterize um, what took place in Bolivia over the past couple of days. Um, let's go back and sort of... Uh, provide everybody with sort of a timeline as to what's been going on because I, you know, and, and I, I started the show by saying this, that, um, you know, we've been characterizing it as a coup. Um, you know, my, uh, one of my, I guess, maxims is when, uh, the military personnel have to wear, um, a, a 
baklavas uh, when they go on TV, bringing out election officials. That's a good sign that this is not a democratic process. Um, and uh, but but, uh, you know, I've had some pushback from from listeners who are uh, Bolivian or have uh, family or relatives in Bolivia. But let's start with just sort of give us the timeline of 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 what has taken place with Eva Morales. Yes. In terms of the coup, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, I was talking to one of the major broadcast TV stations in the U.S. I won't say which one yesterday. And uh, she said she talked to two people who said it wasn't a coup. I said, well, you don't really have to bother with those people because, I mean, this was a coup. The president, you know, the head of the armed forces told the president and vice president to uh, resign. And then they did. I said, what What did they have to do? Stick a gun in his face? I mean, this was a military coup and there isn't any uh, doubt about it at all. And in terms of I mean, of do we know line, that they didn't, <laughs> frankly? I mean, you know. Stick a, oh, yeah. We'd, well, yeah, I think we, we probably would have heard that if right. they actually pointed the gun at them. But uh, they didn't have to. I mean. Uh, you know, there are so many ways they can uh, kill them or just let a mob kill them if they wanted to. I mean, there's been right wing violence in that country. The right wing tried right. to overthrow the government in 2009 violently. And so, uh, yeah, they told to leave. And, 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 uh, and uh, Evo is now reportedly on his way to Mexico where he's been offered asylum. So the, the headline on that uh, Nation article was kind of an understatement. It's all done now. And uh, Trump has now issued, the White House issued a statement yesterday supporting the coup uh, and saying that it was bringing democracy to, uh, it was a very Orwellian statement, saying it's bringing democracy. But you want a timeline uh, from yeah, the let's, election, yeah. October 20th? Well, let's even go before then, because um, part of the, the, the argument that, um, this is not a coup was because um, uh, people have perceived uh, Morales as undemocratically uh, becoming president for the f for the fourth time, I guess. And so just walk us back uh, from the beginning of uh, Morales's uh, ascent. OK, well, he was elected in 2005. And how much time do we have? Because we got plenty of time. Oh, OK, great. Um, all right, well, he was elected in 2005 and uh, took office in 2006. And I went down there actually in 2005, and it was very interesting because I met with him and his ministers. And the first thing I asked the ministers is, uh, what's going to happen? You've been under IMF agreements for uh, 20 straight years now. And uh, what's going to happen now? And he said, oh, well, you know, the IMF was here. They offered us a new standby arrangement. And we said no. And they offered us a poverty reduction growth facility loan. And we said no. And when I said, and, and we said, you know, oh, thanks. We don't need it. I said, well, what about all your other aid that you get? You know, they got grants from Europe because they're the poorest country in South America. And he said, well, they said that wouldn't be dependent on that anymore. So they really made a major break. And for those, you know, at that moment when I was talking to them, that economy, the income per person in that economy, when Evo took office, this is the most basic measure that economists have of economic well-being, is just income per person, not even looking at distribution, okay? And it had not grown for 27 years, uh, 20 of those under the IMF agreement. So this was a major break, okay? That's the, ma that's the first thing. And then they've done very well since then. They... Uh, They've been the fastest uh, growing. They, they've grown twice as fast as Latin America uh, since uh, 2000 in, in terms of income per person since uh, 2006, since Evo took office. They reduced poverty by 42 percent and extreme poverty by 60 percent. And these are all official numbers that are accepted by, you know, the IMF, the World Bank, the UN. These are these are not just you know somebody's numbers. Okay, so this is why he's popular still and was able to get 47 percent of the vote, uh, even with you know all, almost all the media uh, against him. All right. Well, let's. I mean, but let's. Uh, I, I want to go through the um, the changes in the constitution 
uh, that um, in some respects he pushed through. Through, I mean, my understanding is that the controversy uh, surrounding him was that he entered into office. He did not serve a full term the first time around uh, because uh, of when the election was held. He then served uh, for uh, two, uh, two more consecutive terms. At that time, the Constitution said that um, uh, uh, two was the limit. There was a referendum. I mean, this is just the history as I know it. You tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. The ref- right. There was a referendum that uh, narrowly uh, defeated an amendment to the Constitution to change that. He went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of Bolivia, um, found that the term limits were it was unconstitutional, sort of sort of um, uh, ignoring or overturning the referendum, as it were, uh, and uh, opening the door for him to run for re-election. Then that takes us up to this election that he wins, as you say, forty-seven to thirty-seven percent or so. Thirty-six point five. Uh, Thirty-six point five. Uh, if you have less than forty percent, there needs to be a runoff. He avoided a runoff. There was a no, uh, no. The the rule. Okay, there's two rules for the uh, avoiding the runoff. One is if you get a majority outright over fifty, then you don't have a runoff. The second is if you get over forty percent and you beat the second runner up by more than ten percentage points, then there's no runoff. Okay. So he made that. Uh, with uh, 10.6. Okay, and so um, we also now have the uh, OAS, uh, the Organization of American States, uh, came out with an initial report saying that there were voting irregularities. And this is what your uh, piece discusses. Um, Give us your assessment of their assessment. Okay, I want to put a little more detail, but before I just want to mention one other thing that I should have mentioned from the beginning is that Evo Morales is the first indigenous uh, president in the country and really, you know, pretty much in the whole Latin America for 500 years. But it's it's more it's particular in, in, in Bolivia because it has a high the largest indigenous uh, percentage of the population in in the Americas. And, and this is a big thing because, you know, indigenous people were very much marginalized and excluded, and they made a disproportionate amount of progress that I described uh, in terms of the economic uh, progress that the country has made uh, since he took office. But, um, okay, so back to the uh, election and the OAS. So the OAS put out a press statement right after the election the day after, and it said, and I'm going to have to go into some detail here because, you know, most of your listeners think if they're reading the press, they think this election was stolen. That's the impression you get from the media, even though the most of the media doesn't say that outright. Uh, Okay, so the OAS puts out a, a press release right after the election, and they state their, quote, deep concern and surprise at the drastic and hard to explain change in the trend of the preliminary results that were being uh, reported. Okay, so this, this one sentence, which they repeated uh, two, two more times in their uh, preliminary report, and then, uh, and then something like it in their latest uh, audit, the preliminary audit that they just did, um, which Evo invited them in the country to do. This is the Organization of States Electoral Observation Mission. And they're supposed to be professionals and they're supposed to do a clean observation. And they're never, ever supposed to put out a press release right after the election, implying, as they did, that there's something wrong with the vote count when they do not have one shred of evidence for that. That's In other words, they, they just hadn't done the analysis. It was more They like... hadn't done any analysis whatsoever. Okay. And they said this. Now, let's take a look at what they were talking about, because we did the statistical analysis. And, you know, if you look at the press, it's very interesting. Like, there's all these articles, you know, they're all over the press that have the same theme. That, and the theme is that there was this uh, vote count that was being reported, and then all of a sudden the vote count stopped 
after 84%, this is what they're talking about here in that one sentence, it stopped after the, you know, at 84% of the votes tallied. And then it came back and Avo's margin increased and increased enough that when 95% of the votes were reported, he was just over the 10% margin. Now, there's, this is the fundamental basis of the entire getting rid of him because they're all yelling about fraud in the streets. You have the New York Times even uh, saying this, you know, although they, they had an article just two days ago where they had to remove two false statements from the article and they didn't put a, a correction there, but they had two false statements about exactly this, okay? So all the media is getting this wrong. And I, I don't wanna, I don't do media criticism, okay? So I'm not going to trash anybody for how, how bad this report is because, you know, the reporters don't have time to look at numbers and they think the OAS is uh, a reliable source. And that's probably because they don't know the history of its, you know, electoral observation in this hemisphere. Uh, but nonetheless, they just took their word for this. They're expressing concern, and it kind of looks funny, right? The, uh, the, he's only got seven points, and he needs 10, and then he gets 10 after this interruption. Now let's see what really happened, okay? What really happened is this count that they're referring to, and it's the only count they refer to in the media, is not the official vote count. It's called a quick count. It's something that's done... Uh, only, and it was actually originally instituted, I think, at the request of the OAS, it's something that's done to keep people informed of what's going on with the count before the official count uh, can be done, because that takes longer, okay? It's just, they take basically screenshots of the results at intervals and they post them. Now, this count is not the official count. It's not binding. It's not, uh, doesn't have the same rules. It doesn't determine the result of the election. And it's the only vote count you'll see discussed in, in the media, because I think a lot of, most of the reporters don't even know this, you know? And so this count, uh, <laughs> sorry to go into the detail, though, no. but this count was never promised to go to 100%. And it never did in the past elections. It stopped around 70, okay? So they stopped at 84% because, you know, they were done. And there was nothing really that, uh, surprising about it. And the OAS observation mission knows this. And here's the most important thing. There's literally no concern or surprise that anybody who can do eighth grade arithmetic and read a graph, let alone a statistical analysis, should express at the fact that AVO's margin increased exactly as much as it did. Why? Because it wasn't a jump as it looks like to you in the media, it wasn't a jump from the 84%, from the first 84% to the uh, count at 95% of the votes. It was a continuation of a gradual trend that was going on almost the whole time. And what was the cause of this gradual trend? It's completely visible in the data to anyone who looks at it, and it's all on the web. 34,000 data points from all the, uh, the tally sheets, okay? And if you look at the data, what you see is that Evo, what we all knew, Evo gets much more support from areas that are rural and poor. Right. And those come in later. And they were coming in later the whole time. That, that's, that dynamic, it's, it's frankly not too dissimilar from ones that we have in this country. Oh, of course. Uh, How many times have it's you analogous, watched the election results? I mean, result? well, Kashima Swant, let's just say, as, as one. Or uh, uh, Chesa uh, Boudin, the, the, the count of those who had, I guess, mailed in their ballots tends yes. to run more progressive. Those get counted later. That's why the rate of uh, yeah. the votes that they pick up, and the, the, there's a similar dynamic with rural um, yeah. uh, counties in this country, where you hear stuff from New Hampshire coming from the remote yeah. parts, or uh, you know wherever it is. I mean, this is not a, this is not a an unheard of dynamic. But, Nobody denies this. Okay. Nobody denies this. You know, we've had our report out. I just tweeted out all this stuff that I'm talking about, and it was you know it went out to forty six thousand 
uh, for uh, 4,600 retweets, and it's all over the place. And you know, all of these reporters have seen it. Like I said, the New York Times ran two corrections already. They all know this. Nobody's reported it, and I, I think that is kind of disgraceful because. You know, they have people at the New York Times. They have Nate Silver. They can go to anybody in their Nate own. Nate Cohn, to be fair. Uh, you well, get the wrong, wrong, wrong Nate. But yes. Oh, yeah, they have Nate but, Cohn, but they had, that's right. They don't have Nate Silver anymore. They used to. All right, that's, that's true. Right. But let, so, Mark, let me ask you this. So I'm yeah. looking at a, a report from the OAS right now. This is the um, Secretariat for Strengthening Democracy, the Department of Electoral uh, Cooperation Observation. It's the Electoral Integrity Analysis, the general elections of the uh, plurinational state of Bolivia, October 20th, 2019, preliminary findings. Is that, is that, is, is what you've just discussed to us, is that what I'm looking at in this report? Uh, because it has the uh, electoral results transmission system in the preliminary findings. It has, uh, how long is this one? Cause there's two that they put out. This is, this one here is the 13 page one. Yeah, that it's called preliminary report. Yeah, and this one is a it's a thirteen one. It gives an answer. Yeah, yeah. Actually, if it's in English, it has to be the preliminary report because they yeah. haven't come out with the audit report in English yet. Yeah, yeah. I read that. Yeah. Well, I, okay. So with all this said, um, there's these questions now. Morales. Then there was there was massive protests uh, in Bolivia. Yeah. Right. We had um, um, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not over a million people, come out and protest. In my understanding. Yeah, it's a country is polarized. As I said, they all, they tried to overthrow the government in 2009 and with the, the right wing. Yeah. Um, Morales agrees to a revote. Is that right? He he did do that because and this I you know, you could say it was a mistake for him to invite the OAS to do this audit after they had already lied twice about this, but he did it. And he said when he invited them to do this last audit that if they found anything wrong, that he would have a new election. And so he kept his promise. But the right, of course, the opposition, they weren't going for, uh, they weren't going for a, uh, a new election anymore. They wanted a coup. And so they didn't care that he was willing to have a new election. They wanted him out. And, you know, the rule of law, who cares, right? I mean, he's still the only legitimate president, because no matter what you think of this election, you can think that it was a total farce, whatever you want to say. And again, there hasn't been any evidence yet of any uh, stealing or vote fraud. But you know, even if you don't believe it at all, he's still the president until December or something. And uh, because he was democratically elected and there's no new president. And In other words, his, his existing term, his existing term does not end until December. That's right. December 22nd, I think. And so he is the president of the country and the military ran him out of the country. So this is a classic military coup and the reluctance of so much of the media to even call it that. But uh, but even worse, you know, the endorsement of it uh, by the president of the United States. I mean, you know, even when George W. Bush had the CIA overthrow the president of Haiti in, 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 in 1991, uh, he he denounced the coup, <laughs> right? <laughs> because and and he you know put sanctions on the dictatorship that they had actually uh, paid people to install. So because it just wasn't uh, uh, acceptable to support a military coup against a democratically elected government. So we've descended a little bit since then, right? In terms yeah. of what the media is willing to tolerate, especially. Yeah, in, in, indeed. I mean, so I mean, these are the, the I mean, the, these are the most re regardless. You, you could stipulate that the uh, election was uh, corrupted. He agreed to have another election. You could stipulate that he um, forced the, uh, you know, the Supreme Court to rule in his favor. By well, he didn't, stacking. though. They just well, ruled. Of course. I mean, that's like saying Bush v. Gore was forced by the Republicans. You can disagree with the decision. And I personally I have a different view of term limits than a lot of the, the media. Uh, so we can talk about that if you want to. I, on the substance, you know, I wouldn't, I don't really believe in, in term limits. You don't have them. You know, Angela Merkel has been in office longer than Evo. And, you know, they seem to think it's okay for European countries, but not for developing countries. 
who, you know, which, you know, obviously there's a certain amount of racism here, but. Uh, well, yeah, I, I mean, think, but either way, the bottom line is the guy was president under any circumstance until December. Yeah. And the military has come in wearing uh, ski masks and, uh, you know, have said, you got to leave. That is just not a democratic process. There's no way one could argue that this has been. Well, I hate a democratic to say process. this because I, I really don't like to do media criticism, but the uh, New York Times has an editorial uh, which is the first one in 17 years like this uh, that endorses the coup. Uh, is this really their first time that they've endorsed a, the coup? Because it, it feels like it's not. It's the first uh, one in 17 years. And the last one they did it was in 2002. And they walked back from it. It was on a Friday and they walked back from it on the following Tuesday because they realized it was real. And they said it was wrong. So let's let's talk a little bit about the, the potential reasons why we are getting. And like I say. Right. Like, like, you know, I've gotten emails from people who say uh, my wife and I uh, live in um, in, uh, you know, we're in Singapore, uh, but somehow her she voted for uh, Evo at her polling location uh, in um, uh, La Paz. Um, my old co-worker's dead father. Now, I, I, I don't know who this is from. I don't know if it's true, but let me just I'm going to stipulate all of these things. Um the bottom line is the guy's term doesn't end till December. We can't if Donald Trump, uh, God willing, uh, it loses the election in November of 2020. We can't have the military come in and remove him from office and say that this is part of the democratic process. I mean, this is this is fairly uh, straightforward stuff, it seems to me. It should be, yeah. I so, think it's really, yeah, it's really terrible. So let, well, let's talk going. about the, the reasons why this might happen. I mean, uh, some of the things yeah. have been suggested to me is the, one of the things is, I mean, on top of the fact that we have a history, the DEA, as early as, uh, this is according to a piece uh, in uh, the HuffPo by Ryan Grimm and Nick Wing from... Uh, I, uh, some time ago, I don't have the exact date with me, but this, according to them, uh, in 2008, um, after the uh, Morales expelled the DEA from uh, from Bolivia, they started their own strategy of of beginning to uh, target um, uh, Morales in a drug sting at the time. Um, so there's been a history of U.S. government. Uh, you know, uh, attempts to get rid of Morales. Obviously, they're, you know, uh, the U.S. government's attempt to get rid of uh, Latin American um, uh, leaders is longer than I've been alive. Uh, and um, and so, but, but with that said, uh, my understanding is the other, uh, recently Morales made a move to nationalize the lithium uh, mining business. And of course, yeah. lithium rather important for uh, batteries and all of our technologies. What else? What other interests? Well, this is something I've been writing about for 20 years, so I can talk about this as long as you want. I mean, Please. you know, in the 21st century, there was a major change in, in Latin America. Uh, you know, for the first time, I think, you know, and other people have said this, in 500 years, it, it became independent. You had uh, very independent uh, left governments were elected or that governed over the majority of the people in, in, in Latin America in you know, Argentina and Brazil and Venezuela and Bolivia, Ecuador, Uruguay, Paraguay, um, you know, uh, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras. So uh, this was really a new and different thing. They, you know, they couldn't really do this in the past uh, for exactly the reasons that we're seeing right now when they tried. You know, in fact, a lot of these people didn't want to run for office because they were still looking at the, they didn't think it was possible. They, you know, the last time they elected a, a left uh, president in 1973, for example, uh, you know, uh, in, in uh, or 1970 in Chile, uh, he was overthrown with the help of the United States. And so they didn't, but, but then once people started doing it and people realized they could vote uh, and actually elect a president, they would stay there. And, you know, there was enormous progress during this period, by the way, from 2003 to 2013, you had uh, poverty fell from uh, the poverty rate in Latin America fell from 44 to 28 percent after having risen for the prior 20 years, actually having gone up. So you had a huge economic failure from 1980 to 2000. 
And that produced this wave of left uh, governments. And, you know, I don't want to oversimplify, but I, I, I would say it's not really an exaggeration to say that the U.S. policy under both the Bush and Obama administrations was to, it was a policy of uh, containment and rollback. And they got rid of whatever governments they could. They did that coup in Honduras. I mean, they supported the coup in Honduras in 2009. Hillary Clinton wrote in her memoirs that uh, as Secretary of State, she, um, she actually worked, and she worked within the OAS too, uh, to make sure that the democratically elected president could not come back uh, to the country. And so, and I could go through all of these countries, in, every, in almost every one of these countries, the United States has done something to harm or undermine, or in a few cases, get rid of uh, these democratically elected governments. Uh, you know, all the time you want, we can pick a country. I'll right. tell you what they did. Well, I mean, I, I and I and, and and I think you know, folks are at least a, a little bit well versed uh, on that history uh, around these parts. But uh, in terms of the OAS, give us an example of why we should. I mean, obviously, the preliminary results are preliminary, and they, you know, one piece of evidence that they may have. Uh, been predisposed to finding a specific, um, uh, you know, answer in regard to these uh, elections. And, and I should say, again, even if we stipulate that the uh, OAS uh, was correct in finding irregularities, we've already heard, that, I mean, they're there under the auspices of, uh, of, of Morales to a certain extent. He allowed it in, them in. He welcomed them in. He has agreed to a re-election uh, to run this again. And so, I mean, in some respects, it's sort of moot what whatever they found or what their predispositions are, but we've seen evidence of their predispositions. What other examples do you have of the OAS um, looking at uh, voting uh, a, a, an election and claiming irregularities when it turns out there were, uh, and look, there's irregularities I would imagine in every election, I certainly think there is in this country. Yes. But yes, I mean, ones are that are material enough to change the outcome. Uh, what uh, w what can you point us to for folks who want to dig a little deeper into this? Yes. Well, first of all, you know, if you just anybody wants to just go to my Twitter feed, the pinned tweet at the top has uh, all of the work we've done on uh, recently in uh, on Bolivia, including the elections, and we did a statistical analysis of this latest election, even though, I said, as I said, the quick count is not the official count, it's the one that the media is using. So it was very easy statistically to show that you could uh, predict the last 16% of votes that came, that were reported, uh, or last 11% in the, in the quick count, but either one. Um, the, the remaining votes, you could predict them on the basis of the 84% of votes that came before the interruption, because it was the same trend. So it's a very, it's a, it's a simple statistical analysis. So, uh, yeah, so what, uh, um, what is the the main question here? Well, the main question was just sort of where else do we see an example of the OAS yes. coming oh, in? Oh yes, yes. Okay, I did write about that, and there are links in the in the Nation article. But the uh, the two that we investigated, and especially the last one uh, where we did statistical analysis, was the 2011 Haitian election, where the OAS did something that electoral observers never do. Uh, they came in, they set up a little a commission within the OAS to look at this election, the first round of the presidential election in Haiti, which took place in 2010, and the report was issued in 2011, and they looked at it, and they were to, you know, to make some recommendation, and they overturned uh, the result of the election without any statistical analysis or a recount, and it was completely political. Uh, in fact, I was on a panel with the head statistician. He was a former head of the American Statistical Association, and he admitted straight out that it was a political uh, decision. And so that was outrageous. And the U.S. government actually pressured Haiti, uh, threatening to uh, withhold uh, desperately needed 
post-earthquake aid, remember the earthquake in 2010 that devastated the country, unless they accepted what the OAS uh, decided for their election. Now, that didn't destroy the country as badly as what they did in 2000. In 2000, there was an election, and President Aristide, who was the one uh, that was overthrown in 1991, was running, and he won by a large majority with a very large turnout. And they couldn't, and then the OAS initially issued a report saying the election was good, it was very good. And then they got the word, apparently, because then they changed that. And they complained, and they couldn't complain about the, uh, the presidential part of it because it was too big of a margin. Um, so they went for these uh, Senate races, and they discredited the election on that basis. And that became the theme in every media article, not just then, but for the next four years. They, this was the uh, dispute between the government and the opposition of Haiti was the results of the parliamentary part, the Senate part of this election. And this was reported in the media the way I'm talking about right now, you know, in, in Bolivia. They really made it look like the government stole something. And this was used to cut off all international aid to Haiti during this, almost all, really virtually all, because it was all U.S. allies, you know, France and Canada, they were all in it. They all wanted to get rid of this, this president. And because they already gotten rid of him in 91, he wasn't supposed to come back. <laughs> and so uh, they uh, so they did this, and they really started the country and made a mess out of it. And then in 2004, they had a coup, which was of course uh, you know supported by the United States and a plane, uh, according to Estee and witnesses, that was a U.S. plane, one of those rendition planes actually, uh, took him out of the country to Africa, and he was in exile for seven years. And so that was really, I have to blame the OAS a lot for that, because if they hadn't changed their report, they would not have, the U.S. would not have been able to have at least that major pretext for delegitimizing the government and working towards this coup for four years. And this is, a, you know, there's a lot of actual record on this. Uh, so it isn't, you know, uh, speculation. Right. Uh, for example, there was a very good article in the New York Times that showed uh, from U.S., uh, you know, government sources, uh, officials, that uh, at the same time when the president of Haiti was having this fight with uh, the opposition over the elections, that, uh, and he was trying to negotiate with them. He was willing to, you know, make compromises. And they were telling the opposition not to give in, that not to make any agreement with him, that we're going to get rid of this uh, this government. So, and that's that's how the coup happened. And that country has been politically destroyed since right. then. And and that was really so. I would I think those were two very serious offenses by the OAS. And I think if some of the journalists knew this history, they wouldn't just take the OAS. Uh, you know, statements as the word of God, especially with Trump and Rubio openly supporting this coup and leaning on the OAS to do what they want. Well, uh, Mark Weisbrot, um, we appreciate your time today. I mean, the you know, I think um, at, at, the, at the very least, uh, the idea that this has been a, um, a democratic response to something that people say is uh, anti-democratic is um, is laughable. And the reporting on this has been, I think, you know, pretty atrocious because uh, there, there's no doubt in my mind that people who have been following this, at least um, to some extent, have uh, far more information than they did. I really appreciate your time today. And we will put a link to that piece in The Nation magazine uh, at majority.fm. Thanks again for your Thanks time. Thanks very much. All right, folks. Um, uh, there you have it. I mean, I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of controversy, uh, different people. It's uh, highly polarized there and uh, different people have different perspectives on uh, Evo Morales. Um, and that's certainly their um, um, uh, their prerogative. But as much as I have an issue with uh, Donald Trump, the idea of um, of 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 uh, hooded Marines 
um, marching uh, Mick Mulvaney. And as much as I might actually sort of fantasize about this in some ways, um, uh, marching Mick Mulvaney out in front of, uh, you know, video cameras, um, I, I just don't think that that would be considered uh, democratic in any way. And I know there are those who say that, well, when we see a CIA member as a whistleblower and we see all of these uh, national security people corroborate this story that Trump withheld things and this is leading to impeachment, that is also not a coup because impeachment is specifically called for in the Constitution and it is a political process. It is not a criminal process. There is nothing in the Constitution that outlines to what degree one must engage in criminality to be impeached. All it takes is convincing X numbers of, you know, the majority of uh, members of the House and then a, a two thirds majority in the Senate to impeach and convict. And so to equate these things would be ridiculous and disingenuous. Um, that's just the reality of it. Um, maybe politics, but once you resort to having the military come in with hoods on their heads uh, and drive a president who, even if you believe, should not have had an opportunity to run for re-election, is still the sitting president out of your country, um, I think you got a problem there. And, you know, we look at all the problems that we have in terms of, uh, you know, the supposed uh, hordes of immigrants who are coming up in caravans from these various countries in uh, Central America, um, largely because these countries have been completely destabilized over the course of the 20th century because of our intervention of one sort or another. And uh, just as I don't want other countries intervening in our elections and uh, our leadership, I don't want us to do the same in these other countries. And, um, you know, whether it's whether it's, you know, because we've we're funding, um, you know, uh, uh, groups in these countries or whether it's simply because we, you know, uh, push an organization to uh, use its supposed credibility to undercut the legitimacy of uh, the order in specific countries. So uh, that's that. And now we head to the fun half. Um, but after I tell you this, uh, well, first off, this show relies on your support. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, uh, just coffee.coff, fair trade coffee, tea or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority. Uh, Nomi, have you uh, started listening to the AM Quickie yet? Uh, I have once. <laughs> I mean, well, that's once. all right. <clears throat> First off, that's the, I'm very that's impressed the... that you're able to do it because. Well, I do it part of the time, and uh, Lucy Steiner uh, voices it the other part of the time, and then we have uh, an AI bot that uh, <laughs> produces it and puts it together every morning. <laughs> And uh, it's it took a long time to perfect that thing. Andrew Yang would be proud of you. Yes, very proud. Uh, and runs on lithium batteries. So, um, uh, but folks can sign up for the AM Quickie at amquickie.com. You can also access it through your app. If you have the majority app, um, refresh it, update it. It's been updated for Android and for iOS in the past like 24 hours. Apparently, if you have a Motorola phone, from some time ago, it may be a problematic. Apparently, Android is the worst thing to develop for. Uh, Wait, Motorola, Motorola is Android? No. Uh, Motorola phones run on an Android um, uh, sort of a browser operating system, I should say. And um, there's so many different pieces of hardware mm -hmm. and so many different versions of Android operating system that it uh, seems to be impossible to, uh, to get it straight. I kind of want to go back to, I want to be that place in my Flip life. Phone? Yeah. But also like just, I just want a device. It's called the iPod maybe where you just put all of your podcasts. That's all I want. That's all I want my phone for is to be able to carry podcasts around and have a flip phone. I'm well, over it all. I'm over the tracking. I've read Edward Snowden's book. I'm like deep in this space of like, I stop it. Just stop owning me. I'm yeah. over it. Well, that's the problem with we technology, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm on my phone like well, I'd say about... 98% of the day. I watched a, uh, a mini documentary last night on the addiction 
I mean, we all know about the addiction, right. but there, there are. It's it's mostly young men who are going to these rehab centers, and it's insane what they're going through. I mean, how it's caused um, stress, increased heart attacks, and liver dysfunction, and they go through why all this happens, and it blew my mind because, you know, as I'm sitting there watching this, I'm I'm on my phone. I'm like looking up everything about it. I what? can't I can't even leave my phone in the other room at night because I'm I'll watch TV, which I'm also addicted to. And I'm like, oh, let me look that up. They just referenced this thing in this blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. My phone addiction is definitely battling my uh, burgeoning nicotine addiction right now. But at this point, if I have a choice between plugging in my iPhone to charge and plugging in my Jewel, I will plug in my phone first. Oh, well, that's good. You won't have the choice for Jewel. I mean, kind of. It also is disturbing because nicotine, as we know, is very addictive. So whatever's happening in my brain I don't know if with the heard, phone is probably bad. I heard the interview I did with uh, an attorney down in, in, in Vegas about Jewel. I don't think you were here that day. I don't want to know. <laughs> Three times the nicotine <laughs> that's in a cigarette. No, I know. I of mean, course. That's why it's good. Super, super Wait, how addictive. is that? Isn't it supposed to get you off of it? Is it per dose? Like, are you supposed to do? Le- it's, I don't understand. It's like this. better for you. It's supposed than to get you to stop smoking. But yeah, then uh, you, except for then you smoke way more without even thinking about it because it's just vapor and you and can then, do it in your house. And then you're locked into a proprietary technology. Right. Well, also you don't know what those chemicals are, so uh, we'll talk to you in 20 years. Let's. It's one of those. Yeah, jobs. better the devil you know than the years. devil you don't know. Um, I have a friend who still smokes who says that to me. There you go. Um, folks, you've heard me talk about LifeLock. It's a pioneer in identity theft protection. Now Norton, a pioneer in consumer cybersecurity, has joined forces with LifeLock to help protect your cyber safety. A Norton 360 with LifeLock membership provides you all-in-one protection. If there's an identity theft problem, they have specialists who will work to fix it. Hmm. No one can prevent all cybercrime and identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. But Norton 360 with LifeLock is a powerful ally for your cyber safety until December 8th. That's just a little bit less than a month away. Sign up and get a special majority report offer. Save up to 40% of your first year by going to Norton.com slash majority. That's 40% off Norton 360 with LifeLock at Norton.com slash majority. Um, oh, do you want to plug Matriarch? Oh, yeah. Sure. Why don't you do Thank that? You. And then we'll go into the fun hack. Um, so I'm very excited to be part of this new organization called Matriarch. Uh, at this point, it's over three dozen women who have come together, progressive women, leaders, uh, some are former elected officials, current elected officials, who run for office like myself, and they're activists and uh, labor organizers and labor leaders. We've come together to start an organization called Matriarch, which uh, is the, the duty, the sole purpose is to support working class progressive candidates running for Congress, women. Um, this is a space that hasn't been filled. There's a lot of organizations out there. There are a lot of uh, female aligned organizations with different missions out there on the Democratic side. But there was a need to support working class candidates who, number one, are run, running on a uh, platform of economic justice, who understand that to empower women, women who are on the front lines of injustice in this country, especially women of color, especially immigrant women, uh, you know, you have to support them. And it also recognizes that there are more women than ever who are running for office who don't have the tools. Um, what that means is, you know, when you are running, as I have, uh, you got to raise money. You may, maybe you don't have to raise as much money as like the, the centrists do because they have to reward all their friends, but you have to raise enough money to exist. And it's as much as I would love to donate directly just to campaigns all the time, uh, having institutional support, having organizations endorse you, uh, having you know the press cover you. The press doesn't cover you if you don't get endorsements, if you don't raise enough money. So having an organization that supports you early on uh, in your race is extremely powerful. I, I mean, admittedly, like our campaign would not have been able to get off the ground if you were not plugging the campaign all the time, Sam. Like we would not have been able to raise the enough money to exist if 
I didn't have friends who were willing to have my back. And, you know, at, at that point, because of the election, there weren't many organizations right. or, you know, unions involved. But they won't even look at you as a candidate if you don't raise $200,000, $150,000, $300,000. This is sort of like the it's dilemma, like you can't get a job working at a good restaurant as a waiter unless you have a good experience working at a restaurant as a waiter. Right. And so somebody needs to give you uh, a break and... That happens if you're wealthy, like you say, and you have your own cash, you have your own sort of network of, of wealthy friends uh, to get you into that next tier, or if you have corporate buddies and that's it. And we that's need right. as progressives to develop our own systems right. of, of finding those people and of supporting those people so they can get, they can rise enough to where they are considered viable enough for other people to contribute. That's right, because it's not, I mean, we're, we're not going up against any institutions. A lot of times you'll see candidates who weren't progressive, and then they do get to the point where they raise $300,000 based on a miracle, uh, because that's really what it takes, is is maybe there's a story that breaks or a video that goes viral, but, but that's not the norm. And so we want to help these candidates get to that level where other organizations come in and they're forced to go left, um, um, where their their opponents who are probably more conservative, you know, may not be able to sustain their own campaigns. You know, the the, the the way to win is to have our own ecosystem. And so, Matriarch is a political action committee. Um, the goal is to help them financially, but but also help them with like the infrastructure. We have an amazing board of advisors that's going to be offering support. Um, we raise we're raising money right now so that we have the 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 organization actually has the infrastructure to help candidates with press, help candidates with messaging, help candidates with trainings, a different type of training uh, that's not focused solely on fundraising, but on getting your message out, creating your narrative, telling the story of of your community. Um, this is it, it doesn't. It doesn't fully exist in this context. It definitely doesn't exist uh, for women at this point, um, especially focused on economic justice. So I, we, we would love your support. Uh, we are starting up right now. So if you want to go to matriarchpack.com, um, please you know, chip in a few bucks. It goes a long way right now. Uh, and hopefully you know, that money, <laughs> if, if we get to the point where we can support candidates pretty soon, um, we're going to be un unveiling our endorsements in the next few weeks. And we would like to support uh, the first slate of candidates. We'll put a link to that uh, in today's uh, podcast description. Jamie. Oh, yeah. This week on the Antifada, Sean is joined by two of his fellow tradesmen, uh, John Torney and, and uh, Billy O'Connor. Yes, that is his real name. He is a real iron worker from New Jersey, and he's really a Marxist, and he should have his own show, I think. Um, so they do a little workers' inquiry on themselves. They discuss their own work histories and how they became radicalized through historical events as well as their experiences on the job. They poke holes in the J.D. Vance white working class mythos that sees cultural regression, not material factors, as the wellspring of Trumpism. And they talk about the structures they've encountered in their particular unions and how the working class might overcome the provincialism and conservatism of business unionism, which, as we all know, is a real problem. Also, there is a bonus for our patrons if you want even more Billy O'Connor, where Sean and Billy talk about some classic on the job stories, stories about jobs they've worked, stories about organizing and a really crazy story about why you should never organize alone, especially in Louisiana, because they will literally murder you and leave your body in a swamp for the alligators. Whoa. Nice. Matt. That's yeah, uh, coming up for on Literary Hangover, uh, this week for members and on Saturday for everybody is Afro Ben and her story Orinoco or the Royal Slave. Uh, Afro Ben is a feminist, Tory, uh, monarchist, propagandist spy who uh, was also the first... It's like a quadruple yeah. threat. <laughs> yeah, she was also the first uh, professional playwright in England. Uh, oh, that was wow. a woman, I uh, should say. Um, well. There were men, but... That's what it takes in show business. You gotta have a lot of different. Uh, you gotta have a lot of different skill sets. <laughs> Tap dance backwards. <laughs> All right, folks. See you in the fun half. Left is best.
Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice to that. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Ooh. Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're not paying. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, gonna take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agreed. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Uh, folks, we have uh, an official word now. Mark Sanford has dropped out of the Republican primary. So things have changed, ladies and gentlemen. Things have indeed changed. No, uh, it it now appears um, that Michael Bloomberg has officially entered the race. Yay. That's, I, I just, I still, I mean, the only thing that makes any sense is what you've suggested that um, he's setting up a third, I, I mean, uh, maybe like a third party n- a nomination or he's, I just don't understand. Is he running to just because he thinks that he can not win, but defeat Warren and Sanders? Let's not all, let's not forget also that this is a hold that into you just a little bit more. Yeah, nice and tight. Um, this is an industry, right? A presidential election is an industry where. Who did? Oh, oh he's just he just filed in, in Arkansas. Okay, so right, he hasn't right. he hasn't he hasn't. He, I'm sorry. So, so he's he he wants to enter this. He has said this that he's not going to enter the early states, and I think part of that measurement is. Um, if Joe Biden cannot last through the early states, uh, Joe Biden's super PAC could help him out. I don't even, if that's even a possibility, Joe Biden's staff could move over to Michael Bloomberg. The other aspect is Michael Bloomberg just might have a bunch of people who are trying to take advantage of him around him, like Tom Steyer did. I mean, a lot of the consultants are in the presidential industry because there's just so much money and they're like a moth to the flame when they yeah. see a billionaire running. You know, and it doesn't take that much to 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 convince a billionaire that he's like to right. be in love with themselves. Right. Come right. on. Right, right. 
And I think we worked through the other day, actually, in the office, what the pitch is to him. Uh, they're saying to him, like, look, Pete Buttigieg has run third, a right. close third now in Iowa and New Hampshire. That's right. And you have polling places where there are multiples of people who just enter those polling places in New York City larger than the amount of votes that he got to win his mayoral uh, run. And in a third, you know, in, in, a, in a third party game, that actually could make a difference. Right. I mean, so, Maybe. yes, it, it's it's not hard to understand how he could be convinced. And he's, it's not like he's not predisposed to the idea of, I mean, I think it would probably take me maybe like a half a dozen people uh, to convince me that I should run for president if <laughs> if I had, you know, if I had a billion right, dollars. Right, if you had a billion dollars. Yeah, I but mean, even I think if I had like, I don't know. Like, uh, well, I don't know. I guess I probably need 200, 200 million maybe. I think I probably... <laughs> But if well, he's I, running in the primary, then isn't he running against his own interests because he's just going to act as a spoiler for all the other centrist well, candidates? Well, but that's the point. He doesn't think that. We see that, but they're saying to him, like, look, you could. this is wide open. Mm -hmm. Buttigieg right now, if you go by this Iowa poll and this uh, Quinnipiac poll in New Hampshire, Buttigieg and Biden now, uh, their combined totals are greater than Bernie and Warren's. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody's telling him, like, you go in, you, um, you know, a couple of puffs and you've literally knocked over Joe Biden. He's mm -hmm. so wobbly. And Pete Buttigieg, you know, what's he going to do? Get up there and say, I'm Mayor Pete. You're going to yeah. say, I'm, I'm, I'm Mayor Mike. Right. I'm a real mayor. You didn't you weren't a mayor of a city. You were a mayor of, of not even a village. As far as I'm concerned, you're not even I got neighborhoods. I got a block. That has right. more than 8,000 people on it. Exactly. I mean, it is true that no centrist candidate has amassed like a really un, un, uncancelable lead yet. And Bloomberg thinks that that person could be him. Yeah, right? I think that's I mean, that's the that's the most obvious explanation. Like, why it, would he let that little twerp try to do it when Mayor Mike could? Right. And it's like right. and, and I mean, he may actually, you know, I, I don't know. I, I wonder if they're the identical height. Actually, that is, I think that's I think also. They might be. Yeah. And ultimately, I mean, he just thinks that he can beat Trump. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I know Trump. I know his, his game. I've known him for 20 years. I've played golf with Trump. At the end of the day, how many of these guys on stage have been in the Epstein Black Book? That's really right. what I want to know. Exactly. <laughs> um, I'm right. curious about like the way Chuck Todd and Brett Stevens were talking about him, uh, like how oh he God. has a real chance and everyone's supposed to indulge that as if it's a real conversation. It's a very, why do they feel like the need to have that conversation. I think they believe it. But the people on the panel were like, oh, we don't, we didn't receive our talking points yet. We're not ready to respond to Chuck Todd, like actually defending Michael Bloomberg. Chuck Todd, who is famously known for being a former left wing blogger. Like this is how far these people, you know, evolve over a 25 right. year period. I did see something actually very interesting though, um, related to the Jeffrey Epstein thing, because there, this is actually, I do think that there's a, an overlap. I mean, so, what isn't related to the <laughs> Jeffrey Epstein thing, really? I'm really in that space right now. No, but um, on my Facebook page, um, I follow a guy who probably isn't my friend anymore named Trevor Nielsen. And Trevor Nielsen uh, worked at the Clinton Foundation or CGI at one point. He was uh, he was in the Clinton administration. He's just been like in multiple layers of all the Clinton high level, you know, money making schemes. And he made this case for Michael Bloomberg like he was going to save the world and seeing all the Clintonian people chime in from. So I don't know if this is a Hillary thing. I, I, there's still bad blood between Biden and Hillary, but there was it was like a list of the who's who in the Clinton world. We're backing that up. It, it is. I, I still in the 15 years I've been doing this professionally, I still cannot get over the petty personality grudges yeah. that dictate the future of the world. It is, I mean, I guess, you know, like... And pedophilia. Uh, and, and, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, uh, honestly, it, it really, I, I don't know. It, it, I just find it stunning. But Seems like a bad right. system to me, but what do I know? Yeah, it, well, I mean, it's, it, this is, it, it, so far it's been all the systems. I mean, yeah. I think like, um, you know, that's, I, I think it's just, I, I tend to think that's human nature, but I'm uh, still shocked by it on a. Well, it's weird to me basis. is these people are all technocrats, but they really have petty emotional grudges 
that they're holding against each other over minor things. Right. I am all for uh, keeping your emotions at arm's length and uh, living your life that way in every facet. Um, Folks, here is uh, the CEO of Uber. Now, Uber has really uh, worked hard to uh, reform their image as um, as not just a, a business enterprise built on um, uh, law breaking and overpowering uh, local officials across the country and the world, for yep. that matter. Spying on journalists. Uh, spying on journalists. Labor arbitrage. Labor arbitrage. Congestion. Uh, congestion. I mean, all of these things. Um, it, they are working overtime to change their image. And... Um, <laughs> They, I think, probably need to have like a new uh, crisis uh, uh, public relations team. Uh, here is the uh, CEO of uh, of Uber. Is this a name, Dara? Um, I don't know how to pronounce this. This is the new CEO. It's the new CEO, right? Yeah. Uh, this one asking Axios is HBO uh, show. Uh, I want to ask you uh, about Saudi Arabia. Uh, last year, you chose not to go to the big Saudi Arabian government investment conference uh, after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And you said that you wanted to wait for more facts to emerge. Uh, we're now at a point subsequent to that. The CIA has assessed that the Saudi government, including the crown prince, had a role in that murder. You also decided not to go this year. Did you not go this year because of the Khashoggi situation? We had a board meeting at the same time. Well, that's convenient, but you're the CEO. You probably could have rescheduled <laughs> we that. We scheduled board meetings years and years ahead. It wasn't... Uh, would yeah. you, if your board meeting had not been that day, would you have gone? I don't know if I would have. You also, Saudi Arabia is your fifth largest shareholder. You have uh, the head of the Sovereign Wealth Fund on your board. Do you believe he should stand for re-election to the board? I think he's been a very constructive board member, Yasser has. Uh, and I personally have valued his input greatly. Uh, it's up to him whether he wants to stand for re-election. But, well, but from your opinion, he represents and works for a government which you believe had a role in the murder of a journalist who was a U.S. resident. Should that person be on the board of a U.S. company? I think that government uh, said that they made a mistake. Well, they um, made a mistake and somebody's well, dead. Listen, it's, it's, it, it's a serious mistake. We've made mistakes too, right? Oh With God. self-driving uh, and we stop driving and we're recovering from that mistake. So I think that people make mistakes. It doesn't mean that they can never be forgiven. I think they've taken it seriously. And the, CIA, from my guys, standpoint, the CIA didn't suggest that they made a mistake and that it was an oversight. Like with self-driving, that was a, basically a bad censor, correct? This yes. was, the CIA yeah. suggested that the crown prince had a role in ordering an assassination. It's a different thing. You guys didn't intentionally didn't, run somebody over. I didn't read that part of the CIA report. You're, you're obviously deeper in it. But I think from a Saudi perspective, they're just like any other shareholder, right? It's we, now we're a public company. Anyone can invest in our company if they choose to do so. And they're a big investor, just like you could be a big investor as well. I don't think I can be as big as the Saudis. <laughs> I don't That'll think. That'll be hard. That'll be tough. Wow. Oh, uh, the day after the interview, uh, Dara Karshwa, he, I, I may be, I'm not pronouncing his name correctly. I apologize. Sent an email to Mike Allen and to Dan Primek to clarify his comments on Jamal Khashoggi, because if you uh, missed that, he said it was a mistake, but a serious mistake when the crown prince ordered Khashoggi to be chopped up into small pieces uh, and, and killed viciously because he was a critic of the Saudi regime. That was not just a mistake. It was a serious mistake. Like a big oopsie. Yeah, a big like a big, big oopsie. I mean, to be fair, right? I mean, it was a big, big oopsie, to be fair. And, you know, uh, people make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I'm not going to get explicit about it because in this country you go to jail for something like that. But I may have mistakenly ordered uh, someone to be uh, murdered in a vicious, horrible way. And you, you learn from your mistakes. You move on. Uh, the, well, they Uber, Ubered a car afterwards. That's, exactly. Yeah. Then I Ubered a car. And now, uh, this is his uh, response. I said something in the moment that I do not believe. Why? When it comes to Jamal Khashoggi, his murder was reprehensible and should not be forgotten or excused. So, I guess maybe they do have a decent crisis public relations firm, but they just need to have them do some like pre-crisis training. Right. The, the movie Fargo by the Coen brothers is about a mistake like this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Except not with the Saudi government, Gosh. which has assets in every major company in America. I mean, but ultimately, th doesn't this just illustrate that it doesn't matter how powerful, rich, 
uh, what executive level you are, there are certain red lines that you cannot cross in America. And I think right now, Saudi Arabia is a very prickly situation for most politicians and leaders. They just, you're, you're dealing with a, a man who's ruling this government, government in, in this family in Saudi Arabia, who seems to be less thoughtful about his approach uh, to foreign relations. Makes a lot of mistakes. Makes a lot of mistakes. Um, but also, I mean, this is, there, there's been like a norm, right? In terms of, of diplomacy, in terms of where politicians are willing to put pressure. I, I would even go, I would even go a, a, a little bit further and, and say, we have a problem with uh, money mm -hmm. and we have a problem with fossil fuel. That's right. Because um, this is just an example of, you know, uh, this guy's being cowed because of the investment that the Saudis have in um, uh, in his company and probably the political leverage they have with other countries in terms of like, we want our investment to succeed. Right. Therefore, these laws that you're passing that are to protect your consumers or your workers, uh, we don't like. Then I would also add like, you know, this um, in the past week, we've seen stories of U.S. weapons that are supposedly um, not uh, to be sent to uh, Yemen uh, right. showing up and being offloaded from Saudi ships and uh, UAE ships, I think. Um, and this is all part of, of the same where, you know, the there is no, um, you know, people uh, there are just we have just too many sociopaths mm -hmm. who are willing to. Um, allow for, and, and, and frankly, I think, you know, um, I don't like to compare uh, mistakes, as it were, but mm -hmm. like um, thousands upon thousands have mistake, been mistakes in Yemen, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, equally, if I would say, you know, probably more egregious in many respects um, than what happened with Khashoggi. Both are horrible. I, I don't know how well, you... Khashoggi was an untouchable. Exactly. I mean, he came from a family that was very powerful. Uh, with a legacy of, I mean, go back, just Google without a pause, Google Khashoggi and his family, go down like a Wikipedia, you know, deep dive into the early 80s and the Ron Contra affair. And, oh, Adnan Khashoggi. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh, right. Yes. So, I mean, it's, it's, he was untouchable. And I think ultimately, you know, we have to, 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 just figure out like is this where wh what is that line right now like where this is where I, I look at like the democrats versus republicans republicans have a line that's like further they're they're not willing to go after the the people who give them money but like there's a line that's for democrats like a little bit more towards um democracy like leaning towards democracy just a just sliver. a little yeah, bit do you know what i'm saying like yes. i can't i don't know what that line is like whose money don't they take right. that the republicans take well, I don't know as like a, a whole, whole I don't know as a whole, but I think there are, you know, more people less willing to take that money in the Democratic Party than in the Republican. Party. Of course. Yes. But I but I, I don't think it's, you know, it's marginal difference. Do you, guys, okay. do you guys watch Silicon Valley? Sometimes this is literally just the plot from the most recent season of Silicon Valley that I'm watching right now, where Richard Hendricks gets offered a billion dollars by this guy from the Chilean ruling class. And it turns out that all his money is like tied up with Pinochet and like mines where a ton of people died. And then he has to like decide if he's going to take the money or not. But like there's obviously that's the way the system is set up. You're incentivized to take the dirty money. And if you look around who's getting money from who in the tech sector, it's, a wash in dirty blood money. It's total blood money, and that's why they're into this crypto thing because it, it's a way for them to cover the fact that they're taking dirty blood money. You know, whether it's a Russian oligarch investing, you know, billions in Facebook, causing the explosion of Facebook almost overnight, or or Saudi money that's you know being funneled. At, I mean, or Israeli tech companies. I mean, this is, and they also have a side gig of like spying on you. Right. Yeah, and I'm not sure what we can do about that other than continue to expose that fact. And make it harder and harder for the tech industry to brand itself as somehow progressive. Well, I also think, I, I, I mean, I also think, too, that um, if you, I mean, and I, I don't want to get too, too sidetracked here. But I do think that one of the arguments about the, the big anti-monopoly pushes that we're looking at is to diminish the ability of any one player to have that type of control. And you can apply this to just about everything. You can say, you know, we're allowing uh, Saudi Arabia has this 
uh, monopoly on our energy resources. Mm-hmm. And and if we were to follow the the sort of the uh, the conceptual notion of that, it would be to disaggregate that uh, those resources and have renewables that are far more accessible to everyone. And it's very hard to like. I'm going to corner the sun or I'm going to corner the wind. You're not going to have you're going to have, uh, you know, large companies that do this, but you're not going to have um, uh, these same type of behemoths. There's always going to be an option like, OK, you cannot withhold to, from us the sun. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just not going to happen. Oh, yeah. There's um, lots of things that can be done on a policy level. I was just talking about like us sitting here in this studio right now. Right. Well, and I mean, and, and the other side of it is you were saying that these tech companies have liberal cover. I mean, Uber brought in David Pluff over oh. Obama. Well, you remember at the DNC. Oh, oh, my God. I cannot. Ugh. Okay. So the DNC was in Philadelphia. <laughs> Philadelphia at this stadium, which absolutely had like zero public transportation that was functioning on a normal pace. You could for get there. You could you get could. there. But it was a real thing, though. Right. And and you could only take and it was raining. I remember the day, the day of um, the big. Speech. The cabs would drop you off oh at one God. end of right. like, and then you'd have to walk this like massive parking lot. But the Ubers could come right up, right? Because of all the Democratic officials who sat on their board, and and of course, you know, like yeah. for me, curbed is my is my so, go to. So we used in our campaign because right. we wanted it's the tax, it's the yeah. official taxi yeah. app, but. Um, I mean, they had a tent. They were major sponsors. This is just three years ago. And to see how far right Uber has gone. I don't know if any of these people are still Oh, they were there. They Uber was right well, there publicly, at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, publicly, how far mm. they've gone. Because now it's like it's like being with charter schools. Democrats can't be, you know, associated with charter schools or Uber. So I'm curious to see how the David Axelrods and the, and the David Pluffs and the McKenzie types that are advising Pete Buttigieg you know how they're going to line up with with Uber this time around. I'm 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 sure it will not inhibit them one one iota. It would yeah, be my guess. Care. But uh speaking of people who are um detached in some way from uh, both reality and also in their pursuit of money or celebrity or attention or whatever it is. Um last night on Laura Ingram's <laughs> program, the um uh Candace Owens you remember she was the one who, what, what did she say about the, the Nazis? They were, you know, but for the- Hitler similar. was too much of a globalist, basically. Yeah, he was a little bit too much. He was much. too Jewish. That's yeah, a primary critique. Exactly. He was a little bit too, well, um, she had some, uh, but, but I think she said something specifically about like the Nazis, like if it wasn't for this- If they, they were just trying to make Germany great, it would have been fine, but the right. problem is they went into Poland. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. If they had just stuck domestically, yeah. right- but, it was a defense of nationalism. Right. Um, so, and that, uh, I think, probably led to her leaving uh, Turning Points USA. I don't know if that was the case. I mean, there's a lot of questions. So she went on don't, with a Nazi. That, that precipitated it. Yeah. So don't here she is. Don't the Jews too much for no reason. Right, exactly. Here she is on Laura Ingram's show. Now, this is a, a great catch. I first saw this uh, from uh, 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 Matty Hassan. Um, I don't know where else did he, maybe where, where else did he? Uh, Cody Johnson of Cody some more Johnson. news was okay. also tweeting about it. All right. Well, so um, regardless, here is uh, Laura Ingram talking about to Candace Owens. And now it is the case that um, statistically, a lot of people became aware of certain uh, racial dynamics in the country when Barack Obama was president. One is that they found out like that a black guy is allowed to be president in the United States. <laughs> Um, we know that 50% of, of white non-college educated, um, uh, voters, f- uh, found out for the first time that, um, the democratic party was to the left of the Republican party on race. Did you hear about that uh, statistic? That was uh, from identity crisis, uh, that book. Um, but according to Candace Owens, race was not an issue in this country until Barack Obama came along. 
Uh, if the old way worked, I mean, I think there's wisdom to that. If, oh, if Obama worked, Obama. oh, yeah. He's got to be talking about if beyond Obama. Obama. I respect Obama, that. If the old <laughs> way worked, <laughs> I we, like, that. who came before Trump? Right. It was Obama, and Obama did a lot to tear this country apart. I do not remember when I was growing up having all of these race issues, okay? I really don't remember it. And then suddenly, towards the end of Obama, we started hearing all of this rhetoric drummed up. It became white versus black all over again. And I say all over again, I shouldn't even say that because when I was alive, this was not an issue. It all became about alive. race, and I really do think that they were laying down the groundwork for Hillary to run because they had already pre-selected her to be the president of the United States. So they started using that awful name-calling rhetoric, which they fell short of. What did Obama do that that dr drove backed up this the, race the police, discussion. the police violence stuff? He backed up well, he the, myth, the, the myth, the myth of police. police. If wrong, it's the myth of police, police brutality. Wrong, I'm not done. If he, they're wrong, he, he, right. he added fire. Mm -hmm. He added gasoline to a fire that was simply untrue. The the myth of police brutality as something that was a problem facing the myth of the police. Myth of Police brutality. Okay, we don't need to hear any more. There's only so many uh, mixed metaphors I can handle. <laughs> Um, there's nothing worse than folks to adding a gasoline to an untrue fire. That is one of the most dangerous things you could do. Please do not try that at home. Now, now here's the oh thing. I just want, uh, uh, Nomi, I'm glad you're here because uh, I'm not Candace so great Owens with- Candace expert. I, I'm not so great with math. And uh, so um, she said, now while she's alive, now she's still alive. <laughs> at least she- By appearance. She, she appears to be. But she said by the end of Obama, can you give me the date of the end of Obama? At least in terms of the Obama presidency. When was that about? Mm, uh, January tw tw 20th, the morning of January 20th, uh, 2017. Okay, the so end. the end of Obama could be like 2015, 2016, sure. 2017. That's when, or maybe let's say 2014, we'll be generous to her. So we'll give a wide berth as to when Obama started to do this uh, uh, rhetoric or whatever. She, she, she also pronounces rhetoric word. Um, uh, and <laughs> And... Uh, that's when the race thing started happening. Prior to that, in the entire time that she was alive, she wasn't even aware of race stuff, no. which is really weird because... She doesn't see color. Yeah, she, really does, she doesn't see color at all. Now, um, this is a uh, clip from the Danbury, Connecticut News Times. Uh, Danbury, Connecticut, a uh, little city in mm -hmm. Connecticut, uh, central N N Connecticut, more or less. Is that right? Near, near Hartford a little bit? It's, right? it's closer to New York. Okay. And... Um, and here it is. This is uh, January 23rd, 2008. Um, the uh, title of the, uh, uh, the news article is a racist threats case filed by Stamford High student settled for $37,500. The lawsuit filed in May accused the city of, quote, failing to act in part because of one of the callers is the son of Stamford Mayor Daniel, uh, Daniel Malloy. And uh, this is apparently... Um, yeah, this is a uh, mayor, uh, uh, mayor Malloy, I guess. I don't know if is he was the, the, the governor at that point. I don't know. The exact amount of the board of education paid the family of Candace Owens. Now hmm. an 18 year old Stanford high graduate was made public yesterday after the advocate filed a freedom of information request last week. Uh, they spent an initial 25 grand and the school board has 30 days to pay uh, the Owens family by check to their attorney, Norman Pattis. The entire 62,500 tab will come out of a $375,000 legal fund. It was a $25,000 cost to the uh, city. So this is what happened last February. At least one of five teenagers sitting in a car left messages threatening to kill Owens, who is black wow. and repeatedly used a racial epithet. One of the three messages, one of them referred to her as dirty and threatened to burn her house down and tar and feather her. The group included uh, Malloy's youngest son, uh, Sam, sadly. Then 14, the mayor released a statement in March saying his son cooperated with police and did not know the alleged ringleader, Evan Kopech, or Owens before the night of the calls. Um, Kopech was a former friend and classmate of Owens. They had a shouting match during school. Um, the... Uh, the uh, Owens left school for six weeks, saying it was traumatic to attend with the alleged callers. She returned after Kopech was uh, arrested in March, spring. Um, the school system has done nothing to protect Miss Owens from repeated ha harassment and intimidation by the young men and her friends. Uh, so um, this is crazy. And and this incidentally, the school official suspended Kopech, uh, but would not discipline him and other boys for incident committed off school grounds unless the police made an arrest, which drew criticism from the state national association for the advancement of colored people. This is so crazy on so many levels. Um, and now, 
apparently uh, it's it's not to be fair it's not 100 percent clear from this story well i guess they repeatedly used a racial epithet now maybe she wasn't aware of race uh during this um this time this was pre-obama by, well this was so, by a year by uh so about a year her yeah. memory just and and put this in context malloy right who ended up being, I believe, the chair of the platform committee hearings um, of the DNC, became governor of Connecticut um, eventually from there, even very quick time. I mean, that's probably when she learned to hate Democrats. I mean, I don't know what led to Candace Owen from there until here. I mean, she stayed home from school for six weeks. She was clearly traumatized. And um, I, you know... There's, there's, she's dealing with something yeah, and, um, sadly not dealing with it very well. And I have sympathy for that, but my edict is always, you know, um, I judge you if you're a public figure based upon what you put out in the public and what mm-hmm. she's putting out is pretty toxic and, uh, mm-hmm. it's garbage. Uh, but it is, it takes either a tremendous amount of, of emotional and intellectual dysfunction to do what she's done mm-hmm. or just a tremendous lack of integrity. And it's not conceivable that, that all things are not mm-hmm. in play in that. She's also making a lot of money. There you go. It kind yeah. of reminds me of Juanita Broderick, right? Because she was legitimately traumatized by Democrats, including Bill Clinton, yeah. namely. Um, and I can totally understand why she hates the Clintons and hates the Democrats. I don't understand why she would then decide that Trump is good. But like right. sometimes the enemy of your enemy is your friend. Well, and that's ultimately, I think, this weird space that we right, but live let's in. Let's be clear on one thing. When a, when a child is 14 years old right. um, and participates with these other guys, to blame that on the Democratic Party is... Um, that doesn't make quite as much sense. I mean, it's one thing where, where I mean, I understand. He's for the a mayor. Child. I mean, like his powerful. Suddenly, they don't deal with you know his his right. son doesn't have to deal with the consequences. It's a Democratic mayor. All the Democrats are corrupt. You know, you go through these, and if that's her evolving brain, and maybe her parents, if she had said Democrats powerless. usually are the ones who are attacking black people, um, that would at least make more sense. But to say that race was not an issue until Obama. Right. Mm, a little dubious. Well, but she's it, doing the work for them now. Like she's right. she's a partisan soldier, and she's going to say whatever she needs to say to help them and help her help get her. go viral. Exactly. And, you know, like I think she really contract. believes in this stuff, and she is making a ton of money. I don't of believe it. that she believes in this stuff. Just like every other person I've ever met on Fox News doesn't actually believe this stuff unless they're Nazis. Like I, I really truly think. Most of the people that I've met on Fox News, especially young, have it is an act like you get off. I'm sure you've debated these people. You get off off set and you can have a normal conversation. It's the Democrats that you fight with that I can't even we walk off. and We're not talking to each other. Right. Oh, I don't mean that she literally believes in the stuff she says, like, oh, race was never an issue before Obama. But I think she really believes in the Republican side and she's going to say whatever crazy nonsense she has to say to help them. No, no, don't believe it. 100% 100% don't believe it. I, I think, think she just probably thinks that politics are irrelevant. Yeah. And, and that's the way that you can make enter into this. I mean, I, I, I remember talking to, uh, I think it was Larry Elder in the 2004 uh, DNC. And uh, Janine Garofalo and I were there. We had been doing this for four, four or five months, maybe. We took it very seriously. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said something to us to the effect of like, you know, we were, come on guys game day you know yeah. we're we're just we're not on air now we can just we can just talk and i'm like what like you just take this like this is all a game to you well, it's money for them i mean uh remember that guy boris uh epstein epstein okay oh. so are you kidding i got to know him very we... well in 2016 really oh yeah he's like part of the investigation now and now he's on uh what's that, that uh, he's on sinclair, that sinclair we yeah. play him all the time <clears throat> he wanted to host a show on Sirius with me. So I got to know him very well. We, we would have lunches before I realized he was a... No, I mean, of course, he was. He was it was like a ra- right-left thing. And also at a time when we didn't think Trump was going to win. He wasn't... He was deep, but he wasn't... It was unveiled that he was much deeper than I had even imagined. But um, he was so pleasant, despite the fact that he would yell at makeup artists, mm. at, to me, 
as a human being. And what I really realized very quickly in our conversations as we were discussing, you know, right left show, which everybody wanted at that moment, was he just wanted to make money. And every single conversation would come from this place of this is how we're going to make money. This is how, you know, we can monetize this. My brain just doesn't work that way. <laughs> Sorry to like, it just, it doesn't formulate that way. And so the, the communication barriers between us were he's taking this role and I'm taking this role. And he would be like, well, you know, you can always evolve on this. If Hillary becomes, you know, the nominee, you can support Hillary. And I'm like, no. And, you know, it, it right. was just, he didn't understand that it wasn't flexible for me. Right. Right. I, I, I mean, I think that is, that well. I, I mean, no, I, I mean, I think, I think on some level, that is why um, there is a certain advantage that the right has is yeah. that they have no shame and no integrity, which allows you to a lot of flexibility in terms of like, mm -hmm. you know, um, shifting in certain uh, directions so that you can support keep, a coup, keep your voice and support a coup. So. <laughs> That's it. Really? I, I mean, this is one reason why it's been so hard to understand fascism historically is that malleability on the part of the right and that rhetoric uh, slippage and the irony, non-irony, like mm -hmm. continuum right. that it exists on. It can be whatever it needs to be at any given point right. in time, whereas uh, people on the left have, you know, an ideology. It is much uh, easier to be sort of like um, somewhat uh detached and flexible with your your uh racism and your hatred of uh, others you can always just sort of like make an exception here and there can make i ask you just a quick ac uh, question of in course terms of exercise so there's not a lot of places on the left where we can have conversations about issues um definitely not in cable news you're very rarely invited on at this point mm -hmm. and fox and the right wing you know, you are often given a space to be a little bit more open with your beliefs. And, and if you choose to use that, like take a clip from Fox News and make it go viral or make fun of, you know, the right wing or whatever it is, you know, you can use it to your advantage, but they're using you. I mean, where where's the line there? Like she's Candace Owens is using media for her career and shifting her beliefs. But when the left goes on the right, this is a real um, I mean, it, it, what is the line like? Because there's no space, this is because we're talking about Winnie Broderick, and I'm thinking, how do you get so to you're that saying point? When you go on to Fox, are you helping Fox more than um, than? Uh, are you helping Fox because, in some ways, it also promotes yourself versus um, versus like sort of I don't know waging a, a good fight? Is that the question? Sort of, but also it's a slippery slope. Like so. I, you know, I, I believe that, you know, there are plenty of people in America who have not been spoken to by the left and Fox has a monopoly on on much of America. And so you need to get that message out there, a populist message, even if you have to creep it in. But there are, there are many people who think that, like, just don't go on right. because they're making money off of you. And maybe they don't understand the complexities of Fox, but like ultimately they're making money off of you. Also true. But then you look at someone like Winnie de Broderick, who no one in the mainstream media would cover. And many others, like even the Jeffrey Epstein story, right? Nobody would cover this. They would they would hide it. And the only space you can go on to release that is maybe right wing media. And that is how someone like Winnie de Browder, who's not a you know political professional, can maybe go slide into Donald Trump is the person who finally gave my story the space that it needs. Right. I'm not sure I know exactly what you're asking. I'm just saying, like like it, it, there's there's this. There are people like like when there are plenty of people who aren't sure. able to get their stories out, and so they use the right wing. And I don't know what Candace Owens, you know, how she ended up sliding that way. But is that bad? Is that a bad thing for people to use a a, a Fox News or a, what's the thing where the Epstein? Well, thing was I mean, I, I you News know, one? I don't know that uh, Juanita Broderick is is doing anything. I don't think what she's doing is a political exercise in her mind. I think what she's doing is, you know, uh, she has she, she is seeking uh, some semblance of her own personal justice. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, I guess arguably, you know, some broader sense of justice. But I mean, I, I don't I, I don't I'm not in a position to make that assessment. But I don't think she's operating on a completely different sort of yeah. uh, set of ground rules than, let's say, someone like you or I or like, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a, a, a political candidate. Well, what about the woman um, who leaked or 
we don't know who it is actually that leaked the Epstein things to Project Veritas. Project Veritas is disgusting. It's a disgusting outlet, if we want to call it that. You know, most of what they publish is crap and set up. I, it doesn't I well, reflect I, well on mainstream corporate media that people are feeling the need to go to the right. That's well, I suspect that the person who the the person from CBS who got fired, right, this, the, the, that that had worked at ABC, mm-hmm. I suspect that they are just right wing, and they they saw this as a right, you know, as a as a political. Um, uh, they, they saw it as political, like. I think had they gone to a different outlet, yeah, they could have gone to True or, or, or they could have gone to like The Intercept, right? right. Yeah. And right. it would have gotten, I think, a lot more right. coverage, right. frankly. Right. Yeah. Um, I, you know, so I just think that was a mistake. That was, you know, someone was blinded by their own ideology mm-hmm. and saw this in the context of an ideological um, uh, a thing where it wasn't. I don't think it was ideological. I think right. it was. You know, there are there are outlets that are not sort of like mainstream corporate establishment outlets that are far more, right. I think, sort of legitimate from my perspective than Project Veritas. Right. I think, I think, and, and I think that's a broadly shared uh, assessment, you know? And so, um, but I, you know, I think in the political realm, you've got to, it, it, it's, it's a case by case basis. Mm-hmm. I think there are some people who should never go on Fox because they're going to get rolled. Mm-hmm. I think there are other people who like can go on Fox and maybe do a one off, like uh, you know uh, your, your your buddy uh, Rutger Bregman. Rutger Bregman. I mm-hmm. thought that is you know he was basically like I'm doing a, I'm I'm taking a flyer. I'm going to do one and, and arsonist. Think, and arsonist, and I think that's yeah. very effective. Um, and uh, you know, so I I, I think it. You have to have a, a proper assessment of what you're going to bring to the moment. And and also just, I mean, when you do go to the far right and you make an argument, it, there's a there's a careful balance. It might be a very legitimate argument, but it can be completely ignored um, or dismissed by centrists because you're going on that platform. And I think that's the game that they have is, oh, don't pay attention to Project Veritas and that clip because it's Project Veritas. Right. Well, I mean, frankly, it's like, um, I mean, w- we ran with that clip. But uh, it is, first off, Project Veritas is not a reliable source. Right. And so we got to make sure that that clip is real and exactly. we would scrutinize it a lot more than we would have had The Intercept put it up. Because I trust, you know, when the editors of The Intercept get that type of material, I, I trust that they're going to vet it. Right. I, I mean, just they have a track record of, of you know, being a, an actual journalistic enterprise, mm-hmm. whereas Project Veritas has a track record of being... Going to jail. A, uh, yeah, and being a myth <laughs> Literally. Maker. So, um, I mean, that you know, that's the thing, is all this is sort of very... It has to be very contextualized, I think, in any specific moment. Um, this is good news. Um, we had talked about Chesa Boudin, like, mm. I don't know, like uh, a, a month or two ago, we ran one of his ads, which were very, very powerful. And Son of weather underground activists, right? Yes, raised by Bill Ayers, and um, and, uh, and 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 um, oh, I can't remember now. Um, but he he is one of those people who are on the West Coast. The uh, I guess California or uh, uh, you know uh, in San Francisco, as in Seattle, they have um, ballots, you know, early voting ballots that are counted after election day. Mm-hmm. And so it looked like uh, he had lost, just like uh, Shama Swant, and um, it turns out he won. There are now, I mean, off the top of my head, you know, Krasner in Philadelphia is one of these um, reformist DAs. Um, uh, Boudin's going to be another one. Um, this is a, a legit movement. Uh, there's a couple others, I think, around the country off the top of my head can't come up with them. But uh, here he is on Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman. The onslaught of attacks all came in about a 10-day period, and and the police union spent in that 10 days of attacks pretty much the same amount as my (laughs) campaign spent over the entire year. So it was a tremendously uh, impactful uh, last-minute onslaught. But you're right that it's hard to say what the impact was. Um, Certainly, uh, there were many, many voters who rejected the attacks. And I think it speaks to the ways in which the leadership of the police union is really disconnected from the values of San Francisco voters. Uh, The attacks backfired both because they were dishonest and racist, but also because voters simply didn't want that kind of interference or or tone in local politics. 
And so, you know, it, it's hard to say specifically whether I won more or less votes because of the attacks. But what is clear is voters rejected the attacks and uh, saw through them. I think, you know, going forward, we have to be mindful of the fact that the police union leadership has been on the wrong side of so many issues and so many races for years in San Francisco politics. Uh, there's a real disconnect, as I said. But my job isn't to hold grudges, isn't to attack back, but rather to roll up my sleeves, sit down at the table with everybody who's willing to talk and be willing to listen to them so we can rebuild the trust between our communities and the law enforcement that's supposed to serve and protect those communities. If you look at the protests, if you look in the eyes of uh, you know, the, the parents of Alex Nieto and Mario Woods and other people who've been killed by police violence in San Francisco, it is clear that we have a tremendous amount of work to do to rebuild that trust. And I'm committed to doing it with everybody at the table. Absolutely just f f fantastic, right? I mean, that's, uh, I don't know how you could get any better than that. Like, and, and, I, and, I, and I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for uh, his ability to sort of um, obviously not hold a grudge from a campaign, but also to say like, look, you know, we have to go in and negotiate with these people and be able to articulate that police unions, and this is not unique to San Francisco um, this, uh, sure. at all, by any stretch, are on the wrong side of a lot of these questions. Um, but say, you know, but know that he's a DA, he's got to work with them, mm -hmm. and uh, to go in like like an adult and approach it that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I... I that's do exciting. You, do you think the police unions will ever be on the right side of any of these questions, though? Well, I think it's incremental. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I do think that um, to the extent that you have a DA who can articulate that they're on the wrong side, it is, I think, um, at least indicative or gives me hope that the relationship is not going to be one of catering to the wrong side, but one that's going to try and hold them to account. And I think at one point, um, I don't know that they're going to be on the right side, but I think that they could be a little bit more uh, neutral and a little bit less powerful. Um, you know, every um, ex-cop that we've ever had IM into this show to talk about the, you know, all the, um, uh, the, 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 the failures of policing and um, the in terms of particularly in terms of uh, violence on uh, black people has said the problem is that the DAs are not holding them to account. Mm. And uh, someone who has the ability to come out and say that the police unions on the wrong side of this, I think, is going to be able to provide at least some accounting mm -hmm. to uh, the police force and change their behavior. And in, in major cities, they're steamrolling the mayors. I mean, look at New York right now. Yep. It's, it's a perfect example. And, and the complexity of New York, just you have to look at each of these cities and how they're structured. I mean, we have five boroughs. You have DAs in each borough. We have one major police force that the mayor spearheads. And, you know, that's negotiating. It's five different negotiation tables that you're having. Whereas in, in San Francisco, it's structured different. And of course, the electoral system, same thing with Philadelphia. I mean, what was, I think, really sad about Tiffany Caban was Queens, as much as we think Queens has all these progressive wins, it's really just Northwest Queens. And that right. was a, a very strange race where there were several candidates in that race that gave Tiffany an opening. But, you know, there's a lot of work to be done here electorally in, in around the country in Manhattan. And I mean, we have we have a race that's possibly going to happen in Manhattan very soon, um, you know, in, t in two years. But it's, it really is case by case, and you have to think these things through as, as movements, as understanding the dynamics of, of the areas where you're running. And San Francisco's a perfect place for someone like him to be running. And it's amazing that he was able to pull this off, and it was that close in San Francisco. Or the fact that, you know, it, maybe it was a little bit early in the movement cycle, and that's why Larry Krasner was able to break through. Right. Um, because now they're alert, and they, they're cracking down. I mean, they literally had to fix the election for, for uh, uh, Tiffany Caban to lose, but... Again, that was a race where there were several candidates. There were several conservatives that canceled each other out. And Queens is a Trump won Queens. Like, let's right. just be real here. Like, right. or did very well in Queens, I should say. Um, in parts of Queens, you know, he won like my neighborhood. But it's also where Bernie Sanders won. So yep. it, we have a lot of work to do. I don't think we're going to have this change overnight is essentially what I'm saying. Agreed. Now, I would be really impressed if one of these progressive DAs called to shrink the budget for their own department. Because like a drawing down of police presence in cities is 
so important in order to ensure the safety of low-income people and black and brown. But youth. that's well, not their budget. That's the DA's a budget is different from the yeah, police uh, exactly. budget. I mean, the right. DA. Well, will they call to shrink the police budget? Yeah, I mean, well, it's. Uh, I mean, will they call to shrink the carceral state? Like, I think. <laughs> well, a lot I think of these I issues. Think these reformist uh, DAs. I don't know if they're calling explicitly to, but I, I mean, I think he has. I, I don't know if he said those exact words, but certainly in the ad that we talked about, he said that there is. Uh, um, uh, we, we over imprison people and that, um, we need to find other solutions. I mean, so, I mean, I think he ran on that. Um, I don't know if he said we need a smaller police budget, but, um, well, just like the, the thing- idea that there could be such a thing as progressive policing in this country. I'm very skeptical and cynical about it. I think we need less policing and more alternate modes of dealing with interpersonal harm in communities. And these things have been tried out already and found to be. Well, I think that's what he ran. He's aware of. We're still figuring out if there can be a link between uh, these progressive prosecutors and a more uh, abolitionist framework that a lot of these grassroots groups like No New Jails are working with. I think the abolitionist framework is great, but we also have to keep in mind that the, in major cities around the country, it's not just a police force, it is a national security force, which is what we're seeing with the ICE raids. I mean, they're working hand in hand with the federal government right now, the military, yeah. literally. So you're not just fighting community, po- it's like community policing is almost comical in New York. I mean, it, the charade that we're, we're, we're running around thinking we can reform the police department in New York and, and institute these reforms you're dealing with the military right now you're dealing with trump using the nypd to swoop up churro ladies as a form of ice i mean it's it's there's there's such subtleties in the law that they're exercising you know using the the, the, the loopholes you can't reform the gestapo that's essentially i mean this is what's freaking me out you saw in queens and ridgewood right on the border of brooklyn this weekend you had an ice militarized vehicle operated by the nypd go through that neighborhood that's, That's not insane. the police force. That is not reforming in a progressive. I mean, I don't know how the DA handles that. That's the, that's the attorney general. Right. Well, right, I well, think we'll see right. as these movements continue. Like, I don't have all the answers. I'm happy to be in a group like DSA that has people working on electoral reforms and people working within a much more radical framework and working with grassroots groups outside of DSA. So we'll see. Um. You just can't have wow. Pete Buttigieg as our president. This, uh, <laughs> yeah, this uh, Monmouth uh, just came out with a uh, a poll in Iowa. Buttigieg at twenty two percent, Biden at nineteen, Warren at eighteen, what? Sanders at thirteen percent. This is even this is like gibberish. Well, I mean, you know. Um, can we really, should we even be looking at the polls at this point in time? I feel like it's just going to drive <laughs> well, us crazy. Well, we were a while back um, when they were, uh, I mean, the like polls are the How much can we po- really know? Well, well, you know, I mean, what we can know is that this poll says that. And, um, you know, people can choose to ignore those polls or not. But uh, certainly, like, you know, um, the, the, there, uh, there have been, People have ignored the threat that Buttigieg represents. Uh, Brendan's throwing his hands up because he and I have been talking about this for about two months. And uh, I think it's real. Now, maybe that's not where maybe this is means nothing. But um, it didn't mean nothing, you know, four weeks ago when Buttigieg was at five percent or two percent. It means, you know, we were saying he dropped. Everybody said, oh, wasn't that a cute little you know, time cover that he had and, yeah. and the summer of Pete. Look, he had a ton of money. Yep. He was dumping it into Iowa and New Hampshire for this very reason. Mm-hmm. And it is, um, it's hard for me to imagine this guy winning, but uh, it's a genuine threat. And I think it, 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 you know, it should be focusing the minds of people on the left as to, you know, what the, the actual nature of this race is. And, um, you know. Does he have any endorsements? I don't know if he's gotten any endorsements, but I'll tell you what concerns me. Mark Zuckerberg. Is that to the extent that we can That's believe right. in any of these polls, Buttigieg has 22%, Biden has 19%. That equals 41%. Warren has 18%, Sanders has 13%, and then Klobuchar is at 5%. Um, what? Uh, that is 31%. Now, look, 
I don't know any of the details of that poll and, and et cetera, et cetera. I doubt that they've Monmouth, uh, Monmouth has uh, changed their, um, it's conceivable that they did, but I, right. you know, uh, what they're, what they, how they're modeling the electorate. But um, if it is, you know, relatively similar, there's been a change and which doesn't mean that there can't be a change again in the next two or three months. Uh, we shall see. Although I remind people that with the timetable that has been set for impeachment, if this heads right. to the Senate right. in January or February, there are two people in those top four who are going to be stuck in Washington, D.C., and there are two people who are going to be able to hang out in Iowa. That's right. And um, they're not the people we want yep. in, in those positions. So, and, right. and, and knowing how caucuses work, I mean, how, how many of your viewers really understand the, the, the moving of votes and the negotiations in a caucus room and how... I mean, it's close proximity is very, exactly. very important in this instance, you know, m much more so than primaries. Right. This is all about, you know, sort of like persuasion and as close as you can be to the ground as a candidate, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the more value there is to you. Mm -hmm. And Pete Buttigieg had nothing else to do. I don't even think he's going to be mayor uh, by the time Iowa rolls around. I think he's right. He'll have a permanent job at MSNBC. Don't worry. Oh, well, he's not going to we'll make see. enough money for that. He wants more than that. We'll see. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. true. There's not enough cash. He could do that case. now. If he, he could have done that two weeks ago. Um, speaking of San Francisco and their problems with their police, <laughs> this um, is uh, pretty nuts. So, um, uh, they have a BART system. That is their, uh, their uh, subway system. But it's not uh, all of its subways. Some of it's uh, above ground. Right. And... Um, Apparently, uh, this video has gone viral. It is, um, it's pretty nuts. A guy is eating an, a, an egg McMuffin sandwich uh, on the, uh, at the station uh, in his hand. And apparently, cop decides to come over and has a real problem with it. Here, here is some of that. Bro, they want you to go. You are detained and you're they not free to, to go. go. That's part of that. Bro, bro, you come up here and fuck with me. You single me out out of all these people. You're eating. Bro, so what? It's against the law. So what? I tried It'll to be done explain that to you. Bark. Let my shit It's go. a violation of California law. Bro, I have the right to detain you. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Can you please let my backpack go? Are you going to cooperate? Yeah, we're... Are you cooperating with me this fucking law? You're going to go into jail. I'm not going to... Jail for eating a fucking sandwich? No, for resisting arrest. I'm not resisting arrest. You are resisting arrest. I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't done nothing wrong. I've done nothing wrong. I've done nothing wrong. Let my bag go. Just what? Let my bag go. Bro, what is this nigga doing, bro? Let my bag go. Bring him up here then. Stop. Bring him up here. I'm not doing nothing. I'm going to continue my sandwich, bro. I do this shit every fucking morning. Every morning, bro. Let my bag go. 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 Yeah, why is there a store downstairs selling food if we're not allowed to eat up here? And does it not say on, there's no signs here that mark that we can All right, so I mean, basically this goes on for uh, 10 minutes. Um, the uh, station manager, I guess, and the uh, manager of the, um, the general manager of BART, you know, released a statement saying that, you know, even though the guy used inappropriate language with the police officer, it was wrong for him to be detained. Apparently it is... Uh, it is a violation to eat not only on the BART itself, but uh, uh, on the station. But as you heard uh, from that video, and it's very easy for me to believe that there were other people who were eating on this outdoor station. You know, mm -hmm. it's like it is you're in a city. People eat on the streets all the time. That's what sandwiches are for. Yeah, I mean, literally. Right. And um, it is, uh, you know, <laughs> someone just, should just stop them next time they're eating donuts. On the street. Um, apparently, uh, he wasn't arrested, but he was lawfully handcuffed after refusing to provide his name for a citation. And uh, no matter how you feel about eating on BART, the officer saw someone eating uh, and asked him to stop. And when he didn't, he was given a citation. I mean, honestly, like, this is just, it's so obvious, mm -hmm. right? Like, this guy was just coming over and... The the, uh, the idea that, you know, police officers are like, you know, daddy and mm -hmm. like, I don't like your pants down. And I mean, this type of stuff is just, it's, it's, it's gross. And, um, 
first off, he said it was California law. I, I'm, I, I'm going to bet that that's actually not California law. It might be like BART, you know. Right. Rules. This is like BART rules. <laughs> exactly. Right. But he, the, the, the officer actually said California law. Like there's a there's what statute is that happening here? Right. Like, I'm not, I don't even want to entertain these conversations anymore because it's so ridiculous that we have to sit here and say, like, is it the law? Is it not the law? Should they be eating sandwiches? Who cares? The point is, why are the police doing this? I'm just happy that no one was killed this time. Right. Oh, I mean. And it's really sad that I'm happy about that because, like, nobody should ever be killed in any of these interactions. And and we talk about politicians who are being intimidated, you know, who are intimidated by uh, police force. Here's de Blasio talking about, and I think people have seen the video of the four cops, I think at least four cops, one was playing clothes, surrounding a woman selling churros in the subway. Now, I think there is an argument that like, look, we don't want you selling churros in the subway. Uh, because oh, it attracts rats or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, so, that attracts rats. So what? Whatever, whatever. <laughs> like I like like like. Look, people can have rules. That's fine. But the idea that you're going to confiscate this stuff, as opposed to, you have the ability. If there's four of you there, you are a foot and a half taller than this woman. Each one of those cops, Mm -hmm. any one of those cops could literally have lifted her and her churros simultaneously and walked them out of the station. They could have easily done this. They could have, they could have easily done this instead of arresting her. And here is Bill de Blasio trying to justify why the cops had to arrest, why these four cops had to arrest the churro lady. So I looked at that a video with the churro saleswoman. Um, I want us to get to a day where that kind of action is not necessary. Um, I understand the facts. The facts are she was there multiple times and was told multiple times uh, that's not a place you can be and it's against the law and it's creating uh, congestion and she shouldn't have been there. But what we've got to work towards is a day where we, we really engage the community in general to also be clear to members of the community that that's not an acceptable behavior. So it never comes down to a situation like that. The officers comported themselves properly from what I could see, but I don't want it to get to that point. And as you see the evolution of neighborhood policing, we're trying to go farther and farther. Um, And so I'm hopeful we can. But no, I I don't want to take a few specific situations and miss the fact we moved away from stop and frisk. We're never going back. Thanks. Uh, I mean, you know, the bottom line is, you know, come up with a solution for this. I mean, how what, like where is the progress here? You know, apparently, like, I don't know if they ticketed her in the past, you know, and uh, she just kept ignoring uh, the tickets. But, uh, you know, maybe the other solution is to sort of say, like, you know what, we're not going to let, um, you know, whatever the Chipotle's uh, control everything. And we're going to offer uh, people permits on the streets and open it up yeah, well, a little. Well, they do it's basically offer impossible to get to a get vendor per- permit that's right exactly. now. That's my point. It was that's capped, my point. And you'd have to pay like $10,000 on the black market. That's my point. You and open it up. You open it up. Decades. Actually, there's a this morning on the radio on on local NPR. Um, one of our state senators had, was on to discuss how she is. Her name is Jessica Ramos, and she represents an overly um, Hispanic neighborhood in Queens. And she, you know, has a has a has a law on the books to speed up that process with vendors because so many immigrants, you know. Let's not forget, like, there's a lot of undocumented immigrants in, in New York. We know we now have the ability, they can get licenses. Like, it's it, there's there's so many steps along the way that make it difficult for immigrants in general to be able to operate and survive in New York. You know, whether it's qualifying to get a rental lease or, you know, j- being having an ID or being able to get these these permits. Now, mention if they're undocumented. This is what concerns me about that is you don't need stop and frisks when you're just targeting people who you know very well are not here, you know, are, are undocumented and don't have the rights that everyday Americans have. And Speaking. I have probably bought churros from that very lady, in fact. Oh. And you guys have all reaped the benefits because if you think I'm a cranky bitch now, just wait, wait till you see me with a low without, blood sugar without attack. Without chur- uh, churros. Yeah. Um, Speaking of of immigrants and um, refugees, here is uh, Tucker Carlson on with uh, Justin Haskins. Who is Justin Haskins? We asked this the last time. Uh, Oh, yes. He's the Heartland. What is he? They're like a uh, anti... uh, Oh, he's from the Heartland Institute. 
Oh, yeah. These guys, um, when they're not in the business of taking money uh, to create fraudulent arguments against uh, climate change, they're... uh, Oh, oh, this is part of his climate change arguments. Ah, yes. Okay. Wait, are they like it. a Koch Brothers yes. funded thing? Yes. Okay. Uh, Heartland Institute. Uh, folks can uh, read quite a bit about them on the Smog blog. I think uh, they did a big expose on them a couple years back. But here is uh, the increasingly necklace Tucker Carlson uh, interviewing, um, interviewing <laughs> Justin Haskins. Well, apparently climate migrants, uh, which I don't even think are a real thing, uh, are are essentially a category of people from third world countries, from developing nations who are supposedly suffering as a result of climate change, man-caused climate change. Now, I don't believe that anybody is actually suffering from man-caused climate change, but Bernie Sanders' proposal would have 50,000 people, 50,000 at minimum, come to the United States from around the world who are suffering from... Pause it. You could put 50,000 new people into New York City one, like like once every hour and we yeah. wouldn't notice, notice it for, for an extended period of time. Right. I mean, the idea that this country can't absorb 50,000 people. Are you aware that we have lost more than 50,000? I mean, they have deported more than uh, 50,000 people, whether they were, you know, uh, folks whose uh, homes were destroyed in Haiti or whether it was um, uh, refugees or I mean, <laughs> the the 50,000 people. We've detained over 40,000 at the border. It's alone. Un- and- you, exactly. There are f- what 5,000 um, uh, kids kidnapped from their, but 50,000, that's going to overrun. You better protect your uh, second home in, uh, in, in you know, in, in the lakes of uh, Minnesota or something right yeah. now. Yeah, just a quick note on funding. This has received, uh, the Heartland Institute has received about uh, 50 or so thousand dollars from the Cokes, but 1.2 million from the Bradleys, so. Ah, okay, there you go. All right, here wow. it is. So uh, let's hear Justin ha- Haskins talk about 50,000 immigrants. Make believe climate immigrants. This proposal would have 50,000 people, 50,000 at minimum, come to the United States from around the world who are suffering from uh, from climate change, supposedly, in just the first year. And over the course of his presidency, hundreds of thousands of people, because supposedly this is good for climate justice or something along those lines. But the most bizarre part of all of this is that I thought, according to Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and everybody else on the socialist left, that human beings are causing climate change, that humans see to emissions that that's what's causing climate change right. and it's going to be catastrophic well if that's true then why are we bringing people from all over the world exactly. where they produce co2 emissions less per person in places like mexico and guatemala and places like that why are we bringing them to the united states where we produce co2 emissions per person at a much higher rate well, it but, doesn't make any sense and also if you cared about the environment which i personally do emphatically care and actually go outside once in a while unlike most people on the left why would you want a crowded country? It, it, isn't a, it, crowding your country the fastest way to despoil it, to, to pollute it, to make it, you know, a, a, a place you wouldn't want to live? Hmm. It's a great investigates by Tucker. Uh, that is an interesting uh, framing. You're going to crowd the country and make it, you're going to spoil it. Oh. I'm well, from North Dakota. I don't think we're at uh, risk of crowding this country. I would challenge any human being in this country to not look at the numbers of immigration on any given year and tell me when they felt it was more crowded, what year was felt more crowded than another year? Mm. Uh, I, I think you would find very few people who could make that assessment. The word spoil it right. was very, you know, dog whistly to me. Well, oh, this is a you very think it was actually old... a dog whistle or it was just more like a whistle? <laughs> Fair enough. This is a very old type of rhetoric and like eco-fascists like Republicans or people on the right who accept the realities of climate change are still a minority Mm -hmm. in the party, but they're growing. Tucker's one of them. And some of the first environmentalists were actually also members of the far right and extreme racists who are into phrenology and whatnot. But the left needs a real internationalist response to that because like it sounds ridiculous on its face but um like this is what happens when we have environmentalism without any kind of politics or humanity attached I don't even like know if this it's is environmentalism. the same argument that the extinction rebellion guy made yeah. in one of his editorials against migration when he said bringing people from the third world into the first world increases their carbon footprint therefore they should stay where they are 
That is an eco-fascist argument. But they're not environmentalists. They just acknowledge that climate change exists and they want to save themselves because, you know, there are there are there's a group of I, I worked in Puerto Rico for after the storm and I, I spent, you know, almost an entire year there covering it. And I ended up embedded not undercover, but <laughs> they thought I was um, with these these like these colonial uh, tech people that that they're all crypto people, cryptocurrency people. But they all are um, this group of people. Uh, Brock, what's his name? Brock. Oh. oh, God, I can't even remember his name right now. It's been so long. Anyways, just look, look up cryptocurrency, Puerto Rico, Brock. Oh, whatever his right, last I know name what you're is, talking about. The former child actor. So Brock Pierce. Brock Pierce, thank you. So I was at their, their for an entire week with them, and they all, they're libertarians. You know, they went to the Trump inauguration. They're Trump donors. They believe that climate change is going to, going to happen. They're investing in a ship right now where they literally are going to save themselves from climate disasters and go from island to island to island. And... There is a white nationalist component to this in their really? language. No, I mean, no, in yeah, the language, right, right. like we believe we are better than the right, rest of right. humans. I don't think it's it's about environmentalism. They're not trying to solve anything. They're, they're, well, they're, they're, is, save they're using the predicate of uh, environmental catastrophe, which is not accepted broadly on the right. Right. At least in this country, anyways. Uh, to justify their fascist uh, tendencies. And I think that is a, uh, I mean, it is a real, I think, concern that um, unless the, the, the fight for action on climate change is um, not directed by politics, as Jamie says, in some way, uh, that it can get hijacked quite right. easily. I mean, look at, look at, I mean, look at, l l here's an example. The way the right, which... 15 years ago, you had George Bush getting on national television, talking about how saddened he was as to have to promote a um, a constitutional amendment to prevent gay people from getting married. Um, that it drove the 20, the 2004 election, mm -hmm. uh, George Bush to, you know, uh, now where the idea of like. Islamophobia is justified because they don't um, that that there are Muslim countries where gay people are um, uh, oppressed. Mm -hmm. That's the same dynamic, that's right. yeah. And and that's why you know there has to be a a broader sort of ideology attached to this movement because there is this danger of it being hijacked. At one point, it's going to become clear that yes, this is undeniable, and then the right is going to pivot to like exactly, which is why we need the wall. It's well, like when fascists ran as socialists somewhere back in the history. Remember it's that? not just limited to the right either. Like, unless the left has a real internationalist answer to this that incorporates the free movement of people and the fact that we're going to have climate change refugees no matter what happens, probably in the next 10 years. Um, like, there are social democratic parties, left parties in Europe that have taken up anti-immigrant rhetoric as a way to compete with these right-wing parties. And they say, we need to defend the social welfare state of our country yeah. from outsiders who want to take advantage of it. I mean, look and, at uh, Poland right now. I mean, that's Poland. The, the reason why the migrant, it's not climate, it's, it has to do with the war in Syria, but like the migrant route is going through the ocean because Poland is restricting migrants from, from moving through. Yeah, and There's... we're going to see more and more of that as the number of refugees increase, which mm -hmm. is going to happen year by year um, as this crisis compounds. And unless we have an answer ready on borders, you know, if the left just parrots the right language of border security, securing our border and our nation, blah, 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 that's not going to fly. That's going to lead to concentration camps too. Like well, Bernie Sanders is the only candidate who has a platform that deals with these issues. Mm -hmm. um, there's also an argument that... Um, that at least part of the impetus for the, um, the Syrian civil war was brought about by climate change because right. of uh, depletions of grains. And, I feel like the and, Pentagon <laughs> was responsible for that research, maybe. If I, it, it's possible. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, folks, <laughs> we're not even at Thanksgiving yet, but I want you all to be prepared. You need to gear up for this type of thing. I hope people are getting involved in training. Um, as you know, uh, the majority report, we generally, um, and we've been a little bit uh, remiss in forming our uh, paramilitary training camps, which prepare you for the war on Christmas. Um, 
It has been dormant for years, and uh, it appears that it may be back. Um, here's what's important about the war on Christmas. <laughs> This is what's important about it for you to understand, aside from it being funny and um, uh, giving me an opportunity to have the best appearance I ever had on cable television. Um, the, the issue of the war on Christmas is it gives you a perfect example of the MO of the right, where you take an isolated incident, sometimes you either fabricate it or you enhance it, or it just is because you can find you know, odd things here and there around the, the country, right? Like you can find a story of a student newspaper that apologizes for something in their journalism that is dumb. But the idea of like uh, you can find college students finding doing stuff that is dumb uh, because, you know, they're working their way through things is is not a revelation and it's not a movement and it's not a shift in society, nor is, you know, a place uh, in in Wisconsin that's not singing Silent Night or using the word Jesus in their song. Here's Scott Walker. He's got nothing better to do. He's on uh, Fox and Friends. You know, toward the end of the year, starting about right now, people start saying happy holidays. And uh, because there are a lot of holidays, you got Thanksgiving, you got Christmas, you got New Year's, you've got other holidays as well. Uh, but when your point about taking the name Christmas off that tree, why why are they doing that in your well, estimation? It's, it's not only here, it's all across the country. It's being politically correct. Somehow people feel that there's this separation of church and state. That's not the case. Uh, the Constitution made it clear you can't establish a state religion. So if we said you could right. only practice things <laughs> reg regarding uh, Christian faith, that would totally be wrong, which is why we don't. We, we don't distinguish that you can only do things that relate to, to Christians, uh, certainly those who are Jewish, Muslim, um, Hindu, you name it, uh, Buddhist. All those things are welcomed in not only Wisconsin but across the country. But mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you can't have any connection to those things. And it would be like having Thanksgiving and forgetting about giving uh, thanks for what we have and the, our family and our friends and those around what? us. So interesting times out there. You combine that with what happened with uh, last week with Eric Holder and the what? push in Virginia with uh, his efforts to try and redistrict him in the power forever. A lot of crazy things happening in the world. We just need to be thankful going into the holiday season and still remember it's a Christmas tree. All right. Well, what are you Merry talking Tuesday. about? Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> so guy. what... <laughs> Scott Walker really like he he's a little bit rusty I think right I mean or he just rusty? really wanted to tie this uh, back in um, well he had to give his Koch brother a shout out right. that's the redistricting thing there Thanksgiving his, his what is it it's, it's not Thanksgiving it's like taking the thanks out of Thanksgiving so it's just giving so <laughs> that's Christmas we were talking about this it's basically Holder versus Walker like those are the two partisans talking about I mean how would you feel if you're paying Scott Walker all this money and he goes and talks about like Thanksgiving. It's like sure. not saying thanks for Thanksgiving. Yeah, exactly. What the hell are you like, talking about? What are you spending about? your time on? Just one clip a week, and he has a promise to those Koch brothers, brother, whichever one's paying him now. Okay, so in other words, they bring him on because there's a story in Wisconsin. I get yes. this, how this works. There's a story. See, this is the thing is like, um, uh, I am a per, you know, appearance MSNBC contributor. And they ask me if there's any conflicts like, uh, you know, every, I don't know, six months I get a letter from NBC News, you know, any conflicts you have, you're being paid by outside organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it never occurs to me that I could be paid by outside organizations. I never have to write back anything because I'm like, no, I, you know, I do my show and that's it. And but he gets paid by outside organizations who pay him. To show up, and when they call them up and they say, "Hey, we got a story out of Wisconsin where they're, you know, they're, they're not calling it a Christmas tree; they're calling it a holiday tree," and he's like, "Okay, I'll come on," but part of his pay is what you're saying is, "I got to deliver this message for the mm -hmm. Koch brothers because I'm working as a spokesperson for the redistricting project that they're uh, fighting Eric Holder." And that's why he's got to shoehorn that in there. Because mm -hmm. it's cyclical. It's, it, you know, the, the secret of this industry is very rarely do you get on these cable news shows by pitching a story. They're looking at the day's events and they're saying, all right. right, come in and talk about this. It's why, you know, you can go on and be an expert about any topic as long as you can talk about it for two minutes. And, and that's the, the life of a pundit. That's exactly it. And if I had another agenda, like if I went on and just said, like, 
Uh, yeah, this thing is uh, with with Trump is crazy. It's like third love bras. It's like uh, the uh, it fits it fits him to a T, and uh, it's tagless and uh, is uh, very comfortable. Yeah, and doesn't make you feel uh, doesn't make you feel basic. So that that's. That would be like that. Well, if, if folks ever see me on uh, MSNBC and I start I was on the evolving other, into that, that's Jason what it's about. Jason Chaffetz the other day uh, talking about homelessness. And I didn't realize that his whole thing, his jam, every single time a homeless, you know, there's a homeless debate. It was about Kashama Swan and, and Amazon, actually. You know, they bring him on. And I didn't know that. Like, he's the guy they go to to shit on homeless people. Interesting. All right. Well, yeah. um, let's... Uh, I guess we got to go because we're running out of time. Oh. Uh, know me always. So we'll, yeah, we'll have, we'll have plenty of time tomorrow. We'll take calls tomorrow. I'm sorry, folks, we didn't get to any calls today. Know me, it was a real pleasure to have you in. Thank you. I'd like to do it again if you are, are willing. Anytime. All right, fantastic. Interborough, you know, travel. There I'm you coming go. from yes. Queens. We need a. Uh, we need to bring back the uh, the uh, the what do you call? G train. No, the electric Stop. cars. Those uh, trolleys. We need trolleys oh, yeah. again. Yeah. When, when was that? There was trolleys. Like, like they would go from Queens to Brooklyn. Like the thirties, twenties. Yeah, something? you can yeah. see pictures of it. Okay. They, they, it's they ridiculous. Took all the trolleys. It takes me an hour to get from Queens. It's to nuts. Here. It's nuts. Well, yeah. maybe someday we'll have a majority report bus, like the Google bus. You know, <laughs> clean Soon. energy. Soon. We'll go get you in Queens. That's Don't worry it. about it. All right, folks. <laughs> see you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot Somewhere the choice was made For the option where you don't get paid For the road that bends Before it finally breaks you I guess somehow I lost my drive Between the 101